Okay. Sopi, coba kosen saya gambar yang kau ada, yang apa tuh arrangement yang ada gambar kau.
objective, a uh, nice ambitious objective to start with, and then we build it down to priorities, as, as you kindly mentioned, and then we can build on it with action points where people can add a lot, like like uh, Wuchi Yu is doing, he's doing a considerable amount of work, particularly in this area, and maybe maybe everyone won't be able to, to go and offer as much, but by everyone offering something, we can we can start to close the gap at least. Do you want me to follow on your question? Okay, so, so this is a kind of general trend that I, I'm afraid I have to emphasize. And once again, I have to emphasize that I never argue if it is right or wrong. However, there are a lot of interesting questions which may result in individual PhDs, but they don't necessarily contribute to auto conservation. For example, more charismatic species, probably Sandy may want to add something with lions, tigers. There are so many interesting research, probably which will little cons uh, conservation contributions. And yet, it is just going on because it produces PhDs, which is not necessarily bad. However, then, Many people who just want to come into the field because they want to get PhD rather than they are interested in water conservation. So we have to think like that. Therefore, if we focus on ecological research, which would have detectable direct contribution to water conservation, there would be two possibilities. One is it may not attract a lot of people to come in because it may not get any personal benefit. At the same time, Sometimes we, we may stack on a lack of funding. Yeah, so, of course, funding is definitely an issue. I think um, maybe making an assumption everyone's attending here because they want to better otter conservation, whether it be in Malaysia, as, as the majority of, of you are all from, or whether it be from your respective countries that have joined. So I think um, our overall objective of closing the ecological gap is under the assumption. That we, we just want to find out more about the authors across the country. Well, um, one thing pro probably may I suggest first thing is maybe have a one go around since we are already here, mm -hmm. uh, that we need to know who are people who can contribute into the network and also maybe we know their backgrounds so or how they can contribute that's mm -hmm. one so at least yeah, you know yeah, we yeah. can we can uh, complement one another yeah. that's one second probably we could do a table just to list down and which one would be the top priority so maybe uh, just to identify the gaps so we can just ask all right do we have a checklist from your state or yeah. from, from Peninsula or from Sabah, from Sarawak, do we have this or not? Then at least we can tick and then we can see which one is sort of really the priority. And the, the distribution, do you have, uh, you know, do we have an understanding of the behavior or this? Then, then we could say, okay, two stars, three stars, and then, then at least we can really see which one is more urgent. Yeah, I think that, that's a good suggestion. Uh, initially, we're wanting to just kind of get an idea of what yeah, people's yeah. priorities are, and then hopefully moving on to the action points, then we can then prioritize what is important. Um, I, mean, I, I think I like the part about closing the gap in the knowledge. That is really, really good. But I'm also completely that is actually that, but uh, while we are doing that, I think there's something else that is also quite important because a lot of times these knowledge gaps are trying to be, you know, we want to tighten it within the science community, within the environmental community. But then the thing is that a lot of times we are not giving this information out to the people who are also coming across this biodiversity. And I think that has to be uh, also, you know, that, that gap also has to be closed. The reason is because, um, firstly, without having the millions of people and billions of people to understand that, um, funding is quite hard. We, we have known when it comes to research because a lot of time popular fundings are always there. 
governments who want to put funding for Malay Fair when they know that that is a popular word for that particular topic, right? And even investors or anyone. So that is one first thing that we want to do. Second is that why we come to a conclusion saying that okay, this really, really is important and this is the matter of protecting it. By that time, people out there, if they don't have an understanding of that, they are already destroying it. And that is happening in conservation world quite a lot. And I think while we are developing and building our knowledge, it has to be parallel, equally in developing the knowledge outside there. So everything, whichever possible way. In the past, probably portals is a very good way of doing it. Now, today, I think the laser technology, whatever possible way, the other day I was talking to the sir over there from UM, and we were talking about using any other methods like TikTok, Insta, or whatever, because sometimes people may not be able to see what's actually happening in front of them in the roadside, but the moment that has been captured in a certain angle and put into a TikTok, everyone supports that. So it doesn't matter which medium is growing, but the most important thing is for people outside that to also equally educate, be educated while we are being educated ourselves. Okay, that's fine. Probably that's the another part. I think uh, you already said a few of those okay. things that I was thinking about. Funding is really important. So with all of these uh, main priorities uh, that you're describing here and uh, road map or dream plan, whatever you want to call it, uh, you also need to think about funding. Uh, second thing is that uh, set some milestones because you know making a plan is good, uh, but uh, a timeline attached to that. Because some of those these things that you will uh, chart out here will take a few years. Some of those things will be done in a few months. The timeline is very important and you know it'll keep you on the road or it'll keep you on the track basically when you're um, implementing that the third observation is that some of these things can be done by individuals behavioral study can be done by individuals who are here or not here on zoom or somewhere else but uh, uh, for example distribution you can't do individually you have to team up and you have a team here so discuss that thoroughly make a plan here itself get commitment because once the people are out of the room they forget they tend to forget about these commitments so get get commitments and my last very specific thing is about distribution i have emphasized about that yesterday also it's extremely important that baselines and falls at the baselines are important but what we have learned about baselines is that you can also get uh, uh, take a peek in the history because you have very, uh, MNS is a very old organization and you have been publishing those new newsletters. So take a peek in the history, get all the documentation about vast distribution of quarters here in Malaysia and uh, other countries that you are talking about. In that way, you will get an idea what you have already lost and why. And that will help you to learn about conservation in the future. So I think these are my main uh, suggestions for now. Thanks. Okay, so thank you so much for your suggestion. Uh, actually, may maybe it's my apologies for not making clear the discussion. Uh, what is the discussion structure that we're going to have? Correct. We don't just do research to be able to conserve the authors. We must have public awareness. We must have education. We must have all these apps to do it. That's why today we have four main topic: research. How research? We're going to get data. Citizen science. How we got citizens to come in because when we talk about research, it's always just involved professionals, universities. But citizen science will play a role, it's going to be a very, very important role. And then, how we use this data to engage with stakeholders for the tracks. Third subtopic tracks. How we're going to actually address to the tracks that we're going to discuss today. And the fourth one, how we use all this data from research, citizen science, and also track to do education and public awareness. So this main four main topic that me and Benjamin kind of think out that is very, very important to, uh, to actually initiate the author conservation in Malaysia here. Of course, uh, we are, we, uh, like Saro, uh, Mr. Sarawana, you already touched up on the education and public awareness point. Already. So we, we can actually talk about more of it later. Okay. Um, of course, uh, like also, we also have these out priorities, which later, of course, we go uh do it which one we could prioritize more and like this and also dr sandy mentioned distribution yes we will put it into it um 
like I say, as for we only have four hours to discuss. We can't really go really as, as much as I like to go really into deep of it. It must have like an action plan kind of meeting, few days just to talk about it in order to actually um uh get your buy-in, whether okay, what you're gonna do, who you're gonna do, who are responsible agency for this, for this, but but with this 30 minutes, uh well, one hour for one topic, uh uh, yeah, if, if we can, we can try to see uh, whether we could have commitment uh, from uh, those people who are here for, for, the, for, for the items that are listed here. But yeah, so, so that's the thing uh, that I would like to. Hi, uh, I'm Lila here. Um, I think uh, what we could do is, can you guys hear me? Yes, Father Lila, yes, we can hear yeah, I think that we haven't really, first of all, the ones online haven't really introduced themselves properly. So we don't know each other, first of all, which we should have been done like in the first day. So I reckon that, um, you know, uh, those that are in physical, yes, they have already, they already know each other a couple of days. But I think that for us to contribute, the ones that are virtual, especially, um, it'll be good to get to know us and see what we can offer for you for this otter conservation because each of us have our own niches and and activities that we do that might con might help in otter conservation. So um, as a starter, I think yes, right. Um, Wu, I think you're right. You, we need to have some structure to this priority in otter conservation. Um, otherwise, um, it wouldn't. Uh, it, we would go nowhere really. So that's that's just my comment, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, Resnan also suggested that we'll just have a quick introduction from everyone, um, just to, so they can introduce how they can input to our discussions over the next three or four hours. Hi everybody, I'm Nobi Yamaguchi. I'm from University of Malaysia, Terengganu. My research interest would be evolution and the conservation of large cats, especially lions, tigers, wild cats, and also uh, cost and benefit of sexual conflict in, in mammalian species, especially in mustelids, and also how to bring more science into conservation decision making. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mohamed Rizman Naidid from University of Malaya. Uh, I'm a molecular ecologist, so I do a lot of uh, techniques so evolutionary and and uh, Hi, everyone. My name is um, Larissa. You can call me Aisha. I'm the conservation officer. Hi. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, I'm the conservation officer uh, from Strawak Forestry. Uh, that's equal to um, wildlife officer for Militan for Strawak. So um, I managed to care of two things, which is the avifauna and the mammals um, in my division, which is the biodiversity and conservation and research. Um, my main project now is the migratory showbirds, but at the same time, I'm also um, the, uh, I, took, I take care of the wetland habitat. Um, and yeah. But, okay, can I just like um, reiterate for Sarah we do a lot of things. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bubu Kong. Um, I'm from MNS uh, Kuching, but uh, it's just a member. My, my main thing is a tourist guide, licensed tourist guide. I do more on uh, nature tour. Like uh, I, my best one is I always bring people to where the orang utan home is, which is right into the jungle. I'm sure lots of people are wondering also, you know, because of people, some people, some tourists even told me that uh, we keep orang utan for our status. That means you want to be like that dog or what? You keep orang utan, but that is not true for Sarawak. We work very closely with uh, Slawa Forestry, which is Aisha here. Uh, we protect our main um, animal very, very well, I can say, and also our forest. So we have a lot of wildlife, but 
Unfortunately, we have very limited resources and manpower. When I attend this author workshop, I actually resisted last minute. So MMS chairman said, Lulu, go, go, because there is no one done author research in Sarawak at all. And Wu also told me that no one do it. So when I attend this, I feel I should get a start to put a pin in Sarawak. We do have author and this species is here. So I'm going to vote with Aisha. Okay, okay. So before I finish start, so let's just keep this introduction short. We are already out of time. So just mention uh, your name and also affiliation. Uh, just a very short few words about what you do. I think that will be perfect. Thank, thanks so, so much. Yeah, hi, um, I'm my Fendi. Just call me Fendi, uh, the handbag. Uh, anyway, um, I'm, I'm a marine ecologist. I'm working at the University of Malaya. Um, Hello, hi, uh, I'm Shaima. Uh, I'm from Kula Alami, uh, and we are local communities that are working at our own ecological system. Hello, uh, I'm Kimi. I'm uh, with uh, Shaima also uh, from uh, Kula Alami. Hello, I'm Aide. Uh, I'm from Sabah Wadai Department. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sandeep Sharma. I work with the um, uh, German Center for Biodiversity Research in Germany and uh, I'm a um, large carnivore biologist. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Wanen. You can call me Sarah. Uh, I work with Conservation International uh, and I do environmental education. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Waipa. Call me Wai. Uh, from Global Environment Center, now based in Pekan Pahang, and then uh, looking after the peat swamp forest landscape, and then uh, we do camera traps. Hi, uh, my name is Siti Nurain Nambuanache, but you can call me Nurain. Um, I'm from Sabawala Department, currently heading the uh, conservation awareness and corporate for Sabawala Department. So basically, Sabawala Department manage and making policies for uh, our wildlife in Sabah, as well as um, for myself, I'm always giving awareness, training, and also um, um, do enforcement and sort of things. So we are also multitasking, like SFC just mentioned. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Hani Nabilia Binti Muhammad Saimi, you can call me Hani, and I am wildlife officer from Perhilita. Uh, hello, this is this. Uh, I am Enos J from uh, Wildlife Department and National Park of Peninsula Malaysia, ataupun Jabatan Perhilita. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yoni Stanley, I am from uh, so forestry corporations are uh, working as a conservation office. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Christ Hani. Uh, I'm a conservation, conservation officer at Sarawak Forestry as well. I'm working on small mammals, the number one. Yeah, I guess that's all about me. Hi, I'm Grace Yorkson. I'm director of IOSF and because we're on a small team, just five of us, we all have to be able to do everything. So I suppose I do more of the animal rescue, but we all get involved in making new pens and fundraising and everything like that. So it's basically that. Um, uh, Paul Yorkson of RSF, we partly organised, partly funded this company. Hello, uh, I'm Larissa Slaney. I uh, am here uh, representing WildTrack and we um, analyze footprints, which you <laughs> probably know all know by now. Um, Hello, everyone. My name is Azamuddin. I represent the Society for Conservation Biology Malaysia chapter or SCB Malaysia. Uh, we are a platform for networking from different stakeholders who work together. Uh, 
I'm Ben Yorkson, and I am the education officer for the Hi, I'm Ben Yorkson, and I work on education for the International Office of Okay, so hi, I'm Wu uh, So I'm, I can call me Wu. So I'm from the Malaysian Nature Society as the Wildlife Conservation Officer. Uh, together with me today, I have four uh, assistants, uh, Wei Hang uh, and Haizan from the local committees, and uh, Fatin and Afika from Sain W Plantation. So I guess uh, maybe the virtual one could actually go a uh, one round introduction as well, just a quick one. Unmute yourself. Is this for the virtual? So, sorry, Dr. Lila? Are we supposed to introduce ourselves as well? Yeah, yeah, because uh, I guess uh, we would also like to know who is in the virtual uh, room today uh, with us. Okay, um, okay then. Um, hi, I'm Lila here. Sorry I couldn't make it to the workshop this time. Um, I'm a marine mammal conservationist um, based at USM. Um, I've worked extensively on with communities and education for marine mammals. Um, and I have done a little bit of other work in Penang. Also, more on um, social science stuff, like I, I work with communities, I do interviews with communities and stuff. And um, something that could be useful to you guys, uh, because you were just talking about uh, citizen science, is that uh, we developed an app for uh, marine mammal sightings. Um, it's a very basic app uh, based on Penang, but it could be used for other places as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lila. Maybe we could have Dr. Chong Julian. Hi, uh, I hope you can see me. Uh, you probably can hear me before my video comes on. So I'm Julian. I work mainly with uh, the Sunda pangolin in Malaysia. So we have been doing work. And I think uh, for authors, it has some similarities with uh, pangolins when we first started our work as well. So this is where I hope I can learn a little bit of what we have done and how we can contribute to uh, the conservation of authors in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, Chong. Dr. Chong. Uh, next, we will have Che or the Jeff. Hello, uh, can, can you see me? Yes, I can. Yeah, we can see you. You can hear me. Okay, uh, my name is Shaoda. Uh, I'm from Selengo Wildlife Department. Uh, I'm a um, wildlife assistant officer. Thank you. Thank you. So we could have uh, Min Min So. Yes. Oh, sorry for today. My site is the internet is not stable. My name is Min Min So. I'm from Myanmar. You can call me Min. I'm working staff join to their Forest Department 1992 to 2018. In this time, I focused mainly avians and mammals, especially for the endangered species as they are monitoring their density. After that, I resigned out the Forest Department and I joined to the for my master in Thailand, Kimogot University, Thunburi. Now I almost done for the, my master, but I need to wait the publication, international publication for my paper. After that, I had planned for my PhD. I want to study the author in currently my population. That's why I'm trying to, uh, I want to try to Join the Dick's workshop. Thank you very much for sharing knowledge. Now I have some future. I will try to learn more about in Myanmar 
others, and I will contact all of the agents and all of the organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, next one, we have Pon Mariati Abdullah Lakim. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, my name is Mariati Abdullah Lakim. I work for Walep, uh, Sabah Walef Department, same with Wan Siti Nur Ain and Mr. Heidi, who attend workshop physically. And currently, I work, I'm based at uh, Lokawi Walef Park. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we could have Muhammad Asparizah. All right, maybe we go to another person first. Uh, P I P H dash zero two. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, I'm not sure how to turn on my camera. No, my uh, man just speak. Okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm Yusuf. Yusuf Ismail from Ornamental Fish Center under Department of Fisheries Malaysia. So uh, we've been having problem with the uh, otter for years because uh, I've been eating our fish. So I told my boss about this issue and then my boss asked me to join the program. To join this program, perhaps that I can learn something about the otter in the future. Lah. So in, in order to mitigate uh, the, the issue on otter eating our fish. That's it. Thanks. So we, lastly, we could have Sharifa Norain. Hi, my name is Sharifa Norain. I'm working as a part-time uh, program officer at Iku Kekelte. That's all. Great, thanks. So we have all the virtual introduction from all the virtual participants. So just to uh, carry on the discussion now that we've kind of all introduced uh, ourselves to one another, we've obviously got the objective of closing the ecological gap um, within Malaysia and Southeast Asia of authors. Um, we're wondering if there's any more priorities or anything else you want to bring to the discussion before we move on to any actions that can be administered in relation to that. So, uh, I guess there's a so I guess there's a point, you know, raise up, we, we uh, mentioned about the timelines. Uh, I think uh, maybe we could decide the timeline, uh, which I would suggest maybe uh, 10 years uh, roadmap. Uh, do you think this is uh, feasible or is there other suggestion? Maybe I think government agency would very much have the experience on that or? We see this at work, you know, um, like congregate or meet up every every year just yes. to see what you know. Then at least you know it's good to touch base uh, every now and again. Then we can see what is uh, are we still on track or somehow we need to tackle other issues first. So either is it going to be a yearly thing or maybe every two years, you know? Then at least. So, so just to let you know, MON has been established in uh, 2020. We have been have meeting consistently uh, once per year. And after that, we actually have more meetings, which is twice per year, which we commit here. And we, so far, we did that, uh, able to actually meet every year. Of course, it's virtually uh, not yet physically. Actually, this is the first time we met each MON members physically. So I guess this is feasible. We have really good commitment from the MON members. And, and I think more members is the, is the pillar here that could start this going forward. Of course, we have all, all, the, all, all the others um, uh, participants here today. Um, but that is good enough for, I think, you know. Um, hi, um, oh, how should I address you, Mr. Wu? <laughs> okay, um, I have a suggestion here. Um, when I look at research right at the top there, I think we should expand it. It shouldn't be the priority shouldn't be just research. It should be management. There's the management people around. That's why it's good we, we know who is there. Um, and then the educators. So maybe we could have a few, uh, uh, like I think few priorities. We, we shouldn't go straight into research only. That, that 
because we are in the researchers mindset we have a lot of researchers there so the researchers like because it feeds you see um managers need the researchers and then at the same time education has to be ongoing education on trade education on how we treat otters education on you know them not being kept as pets so um that's where the educators come in so i think it should be a multi-pronged uh, approach um of course the fundamentals being research uh, just my suggestions here okay thanks yeah, that's a that's a good suggestion. Throughout the discussion over the next, well, the first session and then the second session, the four hours, and um, we have four sort of priorities. One is research, one is citizen science, and then as you alluded to, the, the, the last two will be threats and then education and public awareness. So research is just one of the four kind of pillars we're starting on and starting our discussion with. Uh, may I suggest, um, I think uh, probably, uh, I, I mean, I'm just suggesting, right? Um, I think probably what we can do is that um, while we are saying that there are these four components that we want to focus and map it on, probably one of the things that we need is to do is set the overarching goal. So it's like any project management. Right? We set up a goal because collectively we want to achieve something. And in order to achieve that, we have some actions that we are doing, and these actions go into certain focus areas, right? So then, then we can take the research part of it, and then in that research, maybe we can have a few points to say that okay, so this is the, the thing under research, this is what we would want to achieve, and to achieve that, these can be some of the actions. Then, probably with that action, then we can pinpoint who or which team will be able to support that. Part. Similarly, the next point of education or the threat and everything. So I think the overarching goal is a very good thing to do. Um, I, I, I may not be, I, I may not know as much as you, you know in terms of author, right? But uh, what I, or probably what, what comes to my mind is that um, author, like any other biodiversity in our world, ecosystems, uh, we need to be protected and we, we are doing studies and everything. But the thing is, while we are doing this, similar to every other universe outside, what we are facing is that a focus is being put on that particular animal in a particular environment. But there's a lot of things that is involved in the survival of that uh, animal or the, the other species. And also, we would want to achieve that by protecting one particular species, we would want to achieve protection of every other species that depend on the same ecosystem. But today, when we are going outside that, probably we are looking at this particular neighbor area, the, the mud flats, and probably the mangrove forest that is being protected. But we are not considering all the other things that is happening to things that is surrounding it. So now when we are talking about water quality, we are talking about this ecosystem directly here and the water quality over here. But what about oil spills that's happening right outside there? What about the uh, shipping uh, issues that's happening outside there? What about all the reclamation that is happening? So all of these things is actually considered a problem, right? So probably our main goal could be something like how this whole thing can be summed up. And then the research could be how these few things, so that we can understand, study a bit more on these threats that is coming, research on these threats, and then we can also pull in all the stakeholders that are playing a part in, in solving the problem. So I think that way it will be. Uh, I mean, th this is just a, 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 a guideline that uh, that we have on conservation projects in every other in every places that we are doing interventions. So I, that, that, that's my own tradition. Yeah, I, I I totally agree, and I think everybody agrees that every ecosystem, every habitat, every member of the biodiversity within. Malaysia or in a certain ecosystem has to be protected. But I think the overall goal in terms of what um, MS and MON and ISF are wanting to achieve is at least focusing on authors to begin with, creating the roadmap that MS are planning to create can perhaps be evolved and adapted to other species should it be successful. 
It can also include other uh, organizations that maybe focus on other species. Obviously, like as I'm here with, 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 otter, uh, with fish, sorry, that's obviously a very relevant species, particularly in relation to otters and wetland ecosystems. Obviously, when we were out in the boat, there was considerable amount of bird life that are also related to that ecosystem. So although we, we have a focus, and uh, today we're having a focus on otters, I think creating a viable, healthy population and healthy environment for otters will have benefits out with just otter populations and will have benefits across, including ourselves, who rely so heavily on water, but will have benefits on all other species. And like I say, if this if this roadmap proves to be successful, we we as in probably MS in uh, relation to Malaysia could work with other species and use these guidelines to move forward in a progressive way for all species. Um, hi, I'm Effendi from UC Malaya. Um, I don't know. Um, for me, because the I'm a simple guy, and uh, I have simple questions. So basically, for me, for the research, I would just want to know where they are first. Uh, what type of habitat they're using? Uh, the third one is: Are the habitats fragmented? Uh, is there enough space for them? Right. And lastly, the last thing that I want to know at the moment is that are the populations getting better or is it going lower? That's my simple questions. And I would think that as uh, we're just starting off this project, we shouldn't be targeting too far ahead. Let's just get all the things that are easily achievable uh, as a new group, as a new team. So yeah, that's my yeah, I think I think you're right in terms of building simplicity, and I think that's where um, Dr. Sandeep mentioned earlier about looking at historical data. Um, I'm not sure maybe Mr. Wu would have more information on what historical data there is. If there is gaps in the data, then obviously we will be that baseline data to start with once we have achieved and um, working out distribution, habitats, habitat fragmentation, and kind of all the, the very baseline stuff that you're alluding to. Yeah, so if you look at the research day, can we have a simple statement, what you want to achieve? Um, anyone can give suggestion, like what uh, we had just heard, all the information is for conservation of water and also the management of the species, basically. So most of this data we need to know as a manager, we need to know how we want to make the policy for the author, not just in um, West Malaysia, Sarawak, and also Baba. So one of the actions that I um, think in my mind now is that we need to have a one-stop center for all author um, research. So that would be a reference for other students, other researchers for not duplicating. So we avoid duplicating um, the research between all researchers. So I do think that is one of the action under the research umbrella. And then um, don't forget research is also monitoring. So once you already done the research, then you must do monitoring. So with the monitoring as well, um, it is adding the data or it is adding information for the conservation itself. So maybe somebody can um, suggest what are the theme or the statement of research on order now? So we go from there. Exactly, exactly. Actually, that's, that's uh, straight to the point, which uh, Mr. Fendi also straight to the point, which Mr. Fendi already mentioned a few parties. Uh, one I also mentioned about a few actions. So Mr. Saravan just now also mentioned about pollution, which, um, okay, so, so I, I think I ran it down so that everyone really get the view. Okay, let's, let's maybe, let's see whether we agree or not. The main goal, I assume that we should have one main goal, there should be have more because we only have a very small group of people. So the main goal is to produce a roadmap of conservation authors in Malaysia. Because if we want to produce action plan, but the question we have to ask ourselves, do we have enough information to make an action plan? So to make action plan, we need a lot of research, a lot of 
data on the tracks, or also a lot of monitoring uh, data in order to make action plan. So I think before we go into action plan, uh, my idea is to make a roadmap. Maybe this roadmap can serve as a guideline for a professional who wants to do research or professional who wants to do threats monitoring or someone who wants to do education and public awareness. And that's yeah, and then how they should contribute the data into this, uh, uh, like, like, like we say, one stop center. And then from there, we gather data, we uh, keep all the data in Peninsula, Malaysia, Sabah, and Sarawak. Then only we could produce a road uh, action plan. That is the, yeah, that's my, 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 my thinking of it also. I, I just throw it out so, so that if, if anyone, is it okay with the main goal? Or is there any other suggestion for the main goal? <laughs> uh, just to confirm what, what's written on the screen at the back is the same as what's written. I can't see that either. Okay. Okay. Yes, you all have the zoom link. Oh, you have the zoom link to go into this room. Uh, can you? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, um, yep, yeah, uh, Sandy again from Mr. Mayor. Um, just wanted to add one more part of the research uh, because I've been involved in other conservation issues in Malaysia. Uh, so we are all biologists. We need actually a person that can look at the policy and laws of each state or the federal or whatever, because to see where the author is at. Because at the end of the day, once we get all the, the biological data, we still need to talk to people higher than us, the political people, the law, to get it into a legal, legalized or anything. So it just only one. So one part of the research should be something like policy and law. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Working with the governments and government officials and authorities is really important. One of the online uh, contributors earlier on said that uh, it should all it should not all be about research, but there should be an education aspect, an outreach aspect, and so on and so forth. While I totally agree with that, I think there is consider considerable overlap because I think it is important to a involve local communities in the research, and I think we've got several monitoring techniques with which we can do that. Um, and secondly, I think it is really important that we researchers share our findings and, and, and our uh, research with the general public um, at, at every point, basically, that we make it as much open access as possible um, so that the public feels um, informed and involved. Can you go back to the statement on the research? So uh, now the statement is to produce a conservation roadmap for the author in Malaysia. That's the main goal. Um, can we have to um, reward this such as to promote research for producing conservation map for the author in Malaysia? So, sorry, madam. Uh, I, I think you misunderstanding. So the roadmap is the main goal, which is how we discussed that we need a oh, main okay. goal. We need a main goal before we come to all this subtopic. So I think just now, madam, Noah, you suggested that one is for the, ob the main objective for research to promote. So can, can, can madam, Noah, you repeat? To promote, to promote research on conservation, uh, to promote research <laughs> I forgot the lady what I've said just now. <laughs> to promote the research 
um, to be used for conservation uh, on the conservation in Malaysia. Is everyone agree with the statement? That is, that is one of, I think, the action, uh -huh. not probably the team, but the action. Yeah. Action. So we want to put in action. So you want to promote, promote all the researchers to find research. Uh, what kind of research for the roadmap? Hi, um, can I add something here? Um, I just like to define what is a conservation roadmap because I actually haven't, uh, I've read a lot of documents before, but I haven't heard what does it mean by a conservation roadmap so that we can work from there. Um, what exactly do you want to achieve with this roadmap? Yeah. And then from there we can have, um, that would be the goal. And then you would have a few objectives to achieve your goal. Usually it's like that. Um, so what does a conservation roadmap constitute, first of all? And then we can work from there. Thank you for the question. Okay. So conservation roadmap, you see, uh, we need a guidelines for people to do all the works in Malaysia here. You no, know? uh, we need we need to set priorities so that you see, uh, we, we don't really know what is needed for the authors. Of course, we know there are a lot of things is needed for the authors uh, conservation in Malaysia. But what are the priorities for us to set out uh, in order to conserve these authors? So roadmap is like a is like a guideline to show that, okay, what are the particular things that we need to focus on the research in, in of authors? And then when threats for uh, human wildlife conflict, what are the things that we need to focus? Uh, and then for, for, like for example, for illegal pet trade, what are the things that we need to focus? And then uh, education, something like this. So with this roadmap, it serves as a guideline for anyone to actually set out, okay, I, I think I can contribute to this part. So I will do this, I will do that. Then data collect, then we will collect the data, publications or, or, or any types of data, you know, on, on, on website or media. Then we collect. And this data will come and produce, will actually collect it and produce as an action plan for the authors. Yeah. So um, what I see here is there is um there is the area of research, which uh, we, we know what's going on now in the country. And then there's the area of conservation and management. And there's the, the broad area of education. And then within research, there's the use of citizen science. So we, we are developing already our, you can call it our mind map, lah, so to speak. Yeah. Yes. All right. We can group all these, um, like, you know, people are saying, talking about pollution, the under research, so we can group, um, you know, keywords from people, I mean, in, because we just think about it and then we write, and then after that, we can uh, put them together in their separate groups and then see how these groups can work together also. So um, that's that's my idea on this, basically. Yeah, um, so, so yeah, Doctor, so we do have all these keywords, like for example, we have uh, priorities for research, we have distribution, we have uh, present absence, habitat use, population trend, uh, policy and law, all these keywords are in um, for, for, the, for the topic. For so the we can find linkages between the research groups as well. You know, then we can, they can link up together, like distributions also related to population genetics. Well, I'm not, I'm not fantastic in all this, but I, I, I know a little bit. And then behavior is also, uh, that reflects also habitat use, right? So the people that work with work with the people on behavior, that kind of thing, you know. So it's like an interlinking, and then it all makes sense in the end, and everyone knows what they're doing, so to so to speak, lah. Okay. Let's hammer on there. Hi, Fred. Hi, Fred. Do you want to say anything? Or did he just, or did he just didn't unmute himself? <laughs> I mean, didn't mute himself. Okay, uh, okay. so go back to the discussion uh, where Madam Noah actually suggested the objective, um, the objective or the end for the research to prom, uh, although we put in action, so we still need an objective, or do you agree that we need objective? For me, I think we need objective to actually know where we are heading to. 
Good yeah, certainly. I think we need an objective uh, for our goal. Uh, if the goal is a conservation map, we need to have a few objectives to achieve the goal. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Now our statement is to produce author conservation roadmap in what five to ten years time. Ten years time. Okay. Under research. Of course, we need to have enough research as input for auto conservation. That would be objective number one, I think. So we have enough inputs, enough research um, for the auto action plan in Malaysia, right? And then maybe the second is um, the second objective for research is to know all the threats and issues towards auto conservation in Malaysia. So both of uh, most of the research maybe can. Um, uh, look at these two main objectives as inputs for the roadmap letter or action plan for author. I think the second objective we could go into the topics called tracks. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think we can put that objective for research. Can you, uh, can you repeat again for the objective for the research? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we need a repeat. Um, to produce author conservation roadmap, um, number one objective is to have enough research as the input for author conservation roadmap. And then the second one is to know the threats of the author in Malaysia. And then the third one, the issue on author conservation in Malaysia. So I don't know whether is these three objective is sufficient to support for the roadmap. If not, then we can add more objective under that. Okay. Uh, let's again. Okay. Let's uh, produce a uh, process a bit. Uh, so I guess there's a two keywords uh, in your statement for the objective research, which is uh, to conduct more research in order to gather inputs. So I guess the objective we could say that to conduct, uh, to conduct, to conduct sufficient um, ecological research to gather inputs for the conservation of authors in Malaysia. The track, the track we will keep it for the track part. The track we will keep it for the track part. We will keep that, but we will need you to remind later again. <laughs> I guess baseline data will be better words than input. Right, baseline data. I'm doing baseline data for the auto conservation in Malaysia. I think. I think I think we are we are getting lost into the semantics of these uh, terminologies, uh, and we probably will lose more time with that. So we can do that at editing stage. When you have that book, we can do another Zoom call and do that at editing stage. But right now, let's focus, let's circle back on what we were discussing. So what are the priorities? Can we achieve them in the given time period? And if we have to achieve them, what do we need from people who are here? And again, going back to funding. So, so sorry, but uh, the consensus that is emerging here is distribution mapping is really important. And when you plan for distribution mapping for any species, you need to come up with one guideline that everyone can use, everyone can agree on, and everyone can use. Otherwise, you will have apples and oranges from two different parts of uh, Malaysia. So think about that. Um, and uh, again, going back to timeline, can we achieve that in two years, let's say? Um, it could be three years, two years, whatever you decide. And then, um, what kind of guidelines are we going to follow? 
in last two days, we have seen that there are multitude of methods that we can use. So let's get a consensus here. Are we going to use interviews, tracks, uh, uh, genetics, frames, or whatever, science surveys. So let's, let's discuss that for next 10, 10, 15 minutes and block it and move on, onward. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. I think we have an objective. We all agree on the overall objective no matter how it's terminalized, it's, it's about what we're trying to achieve. So now we need to look at the actions about what, what each and every one of us, or each and every one of you here in Malaysia can input into obtaining the priorities and therefore reaching the goal objectives. So like, like Dr. Sandy has said, we now need to look at the actions that, that we can all do to take our steps forward that we're looking to do. Well, I guess uh, I guess one of the action here is actually identify research method. We need to identify what is the research method that we're going to use um, uh, to achieve some of the ecological research here. So uh, and then so everyone does everyone agree that the timeline is let's uh, just put ten years first timeline. Too far. No, too far. Okay, let's let's talk about this for years. So, sorry to interrupt, must be microphone because the... So if you want to have the auto action plan in Malaysia in two years, is it sufficient data enough? No, not, not action plan, it's a roadmap. Not, it's not a roadmap. yet, can't. It's a roadmap. Um, now we want to achieve, the timeline is uh, to achieve the um, roadmap, right? Yes. Or yes. already produce the action plan, or already produce it, not yet. Not yet, not, not yet. yet. So now we are determining um, the timeline to have the action plan. Okay, I think. Is it the timeline to have the action plan or? Okay, I think there's a confusion. My apologies, there's a confusion here already. Okay, so like I say this is a roadmap. This is a roadmap for the people to know what are the priorities for author conservation in Malaysia, what you can do, what you think you can achieve, uh, what you think you can contribute to the author conservation uh, in Malaysia. So uh, the timeline here um, is, yeah, I don't think that is worth for here, the timeline, because this is a roadmap for people to know uh, what they can, like I say, what they can contribute, what they need to focus, then they do the work. So actually, the timeline is more for action plan. I'm just a fifth I'm just a fifth <laughs> Okay, guys. Um, so we we know that we, we have already got a lot of information. We know that a lot of techniques are going on still, and we, we are trying to get this roadmap done, right? But in order for it, then we have a few components of it. And research is one of the most important things that we need to know what's going on, right? So now we know that 
This research is to find out information that we don't know, or probably also to, to know to, to affirm certain things that we are already doing. So, in that sense, they probably would want to find out what is it that we would really want to research on. Let's just put that inside here first. Because if we say that we want to research on, for example, footprint, then how long it will really take. Only then we'll be able to tell how long exactly we, we, we will need to, to achieve that. Because if let's say we are setting two years, but then if the two years is, will not be feasible, then it is an uh, ambitious uh, goal that we may not be achieving. So probably we also need to know what exactly we need to do in that. So probably we just put down all the things that we really, really need for the research program. What is it that we need to research? What is it that we don't know? What is the gap? Then we'll just put that up here. Right? So uh, maybe very quickly, anyone, what we need to know that we don't know? Where? 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 Distribution. Okay. So, okay. So um, distribution is one. So both East and West Malaysia, we need to really know. So at the moment, maybe we really don't know where exactly they are. So by knowing the distribution, where, uh, where, where exactly these animals are and the numbers. So this is right. So basically here we are saying there is a location. Uh, I, I, pardon me, the words that I use is not the kind of words that normally you use for this purpose. But location and basically numbers. A map. Okay. Then mapping. Ah. Yeah. All right. So, you know, pardon? Yeah, for the numbers, right? Probably it will take much longer time, but there needs to be something that can say whether you have 500, you have 1,000, or you have 1,500. So, I'm not sure. So, that is a part of research as well. I don't know if there is a technique. If there is none, we can discount it. There's no enough possible way of finding it, right? I think of now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So under this distribution of species, location, a map, is there anything that needs to be put inside? Is there anything that uh, uh, probably the kind of technique that you will be using for this particular aspect? Maybe we can just put it because then the person who's expert in that particular technique will be able to tell how long it will really take. Because a person like me who don't know about the technique, I will not be able to tell how long it will take. So the person who knows will then be able to set the timeline for that. Right? What kind of technique might be needed here? Can we just list it down, probably? Uh, let me just go into this part. I think to, to this is my opinion. Uh, each one of us actually uh, know what you know. I mean, know what your best is that you can use. Each people has their own expert. Each people are good at anything. Some people are good at scientific methods. Some people are good at GIS math. Some people are good at interview talking to people. So I guess uh, we could we could use multidisciplinary methods in order to survey. The authors, like for example, um, uh, some is good genetic. Let's just start with genetic, collect author spring. That could give some information about distribution. Camera trapping, camera trap. Yes, interview survey. Interview survey. Uh, citizen science. Can I get the same suggestion? Yeah, yeah, correct. Sure. Uh, yes. Well, it depends on my experience, especially for Myanmar. We we want to do faster research for Myanmar. Firstly, I already explained trap distribution of the Myanmar author when they're distributed. I already explained. But there is the 
my personal connection and some people just contact the online look like the survey. Now Myanmar is the draft information which division which take which protected area has the information of the author, but this is not sure. That's why after getting this draft distribution, we need to the about like this location and met. After that, we can contact the or the area interview survey. Interview survey, we need to do the both of when I got the information, who gave to me first, we need to check for example, Forrester. After that, we need to who were live very close to the altar area. That's why we can choose two type of cautionary survey, forester and local. After that, we can get the more confirmed which one is the available for the altar survey. After that, I can we can stop the track and science survey collaborated with the forester or local. After that, we can next step, after we got the enough data track and sign, that's why we can use camera track. That's why I think we finally, we can get the complete data for my country, especially for Myanmar. That's my suggestion. Well, thank you for your suggestion. Of course, uh, and also I think, very important if we want to do distribution map, I think one of the methods uh, we need to GIS. GIS, yeah. Is there any more addition? Okay, so for distribution of species at the moment, we have um, location uh, and mapping, right? So under that, we have uh, genetic uh, author sprays camera trap, uh, interview surveys, GIS, all of that. Anything else that we missed? Good thing, yes. All right. Anything else missing from here for this? Citizen um, I just want to add a little bit to this. I think that, um, I'm not an order person, so I, but I'm basing on what I study with marine mammals is that isn't there a certain kind of habitat where these guys hang out often enough? Um, what is their habitat? And then from there, we can do a, a, like look into interview surveys on, in the habitat, you know, with lo local citizens. And then after that, we can actually do the research. So um, because for me, I, I work with um, other marine mammals and they have specific habitats. Um, like what you, I mean, yesterday I learned a lot. Um, you said that they, even their food also is very uh, particular for a particular species. So the same goes for other marine mammals as well. So I think habitat mapping, um, possible habitat for otters and then looking into distribution, like actually doing setting up the camera traps there and seeing that would give you an overall picture of the country, I think. Yeah. So, so again, I think I have, we are talking about multiple layers of information and uh, what we are enlisting here are tools that we are going to use, but we also need to enlist process. Because uh, uh, as we have been discussing, we have to use all kind of data that is available. Uh, again, to start with, the first thing, what, what she is saying that we need to find out the uh, habitat um, uh, that you can do with uh, all of these uh, predictive habitat mapping analysis and all of that, those things. But uh, to start with, using all of these tools, just get information about presence absence. That's the first thing. And then we can convert that using all of these tools, GIS and all, into occupancy maps. Occupancy maps will give us information about what kind of habitat variables are affecting distribution of otters in Malaysia. Then you go to the second stage, you think about numbers. 
how many authors are there. And then with all of this data, camera trap, genetics, footprint ID, you can get information about numbers. And then we translate that into density. When you translate that into density, then you will get information about why there are certain uh, areas having high density of certain species of otters and not the others. Okay, then we are talking about trends. Once you get to the density, then we are talking about trends. So it's stepwise procedure and it will take some time. So the first step is just to know where they are. Again, okay, going back, circling back where they are and uh, mapping them. What, what, uh, what I'm trying to say here is the process has already been there in other species. So what we are discussing here is already established process. Uh, and, and we don't need to spend too much of time of what in, in describing the process. What we need here is uh, to get commitment. Okay? Uh, who will do where, what, do we agree on these methods? So that will get us to some achievable result. Uh, by the end of two, three years, whatever you decide. But, but then I think uh, that's a valid question, Dr. Sandeep. But then the question is, will we able to decide who and what we use? Because um, everything we discuss here, eventually we still have to, like, for example, government agency, they can't decide uh, what they're going to do now. They can't decide. It all depends on the top management, whether they can do that or not. And of course, university, universities, lecturers as well. Uh, whether they can really commit. So, so uh, that, that is a very good question. Yes, we do need the commitment, but uh, I, I big doubt that today we can actually decide who and uh, who and actually what they can do. So, so, so yeah. Do, do it's, I answer? it's not about, it's not about getting their consent. It's about getting their suggestions. So here's the methodology. As a government representative, do they or university representative, do they agree on these things? And then you, MNS, uh, prepare this this entire process map and propose it. That grid size will be nine square kilometer. Uh, we are going to use these 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 methods for establishing the order presence absence, right? So uh, by commitment, it's not that we ask them to sign something right here. <laughs> no, not that. But then, if, if it is this way, the discussion we have to go very detailed and goes back to the timing. Do we do we have the like for example, if we just want to discuss research, we already use up already one and a half hour. That's why actually today it's just a surface uh, discussion where we need points, and then like uh, we could have the second virtual meeting, the third virtual meeting to keep on improving, finalize, keep on getting more details. Uh, if we want to talk about what are the grid size today, uh, that, that uh, I don't think we really got the time to go through. No, exactly, Jim. So, so let's just focus on the objectives. Uh, we are going into nitty gritties of this. Let's just focus on the objective. All of us agree that distribution map is really important. Let's move on. We are not going to discuss how are we going to do it, but let's move on to the second topic. I think as well, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that the roadmap is going to be, obviously we've had the luxury of two or three days um, of learning from people around us that are auto experts. I think from speaking to, to Wu that the plan is that this can be used by everybody. So bringing it down to a more basic level is important to the general public in terms of citizen science. What somebody could look at this roadmap that they produce and say, I, I can achieve this small part in this small area. Um, whereas someone as um, that's been doing the work like, like we himself can achieve a lot more that probably the general person can. Yeah, that's why this is a, uh, I'm not sure whether this actually, uh, 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 um, is this same as your mindset? Like, like for example, now, like Dr. Sandeep, we already mentioned distribution here. Then we go to the next one, population genetic. So these are the surface information that we need, I think, as for now. Um, I think many are extremely important because you might be suggesting one thing for the sake of uh, already proven track record, 
Of course, I don't, I, I'm not saying the UK situation can be directly applicable to Malaysian situation. We all know that. However, would you mind my asking our UK colleagues, if you have to choose three or let's say five most important key findings of research behind the author recolonization or the expansion, what can you choose? Let's say three or maybe less than five. I would say I would say distribution is the most important. And I'll take this something we haven't mentioned is, is the diet, because the diet is the most important role in contributing um, to the otter. And maybe the hatter, which has a sort of becoming a third. I think you need accurate data. It comes back to this numbers thing. In the UK, there's a lot of misinformation where people are saying there's otters everywhere because they saw one here, one there, one there, and obviously three otters. So if we're going into the numbers game, it could be quite a dangerous thing to do. So we've got to be very careful. I think following on from that and, and from what uh, Dr. Sandy was alluded to, I think the most important thing moving forward is basically finding if they're there or if they're not in certain areas. So obviously we have information here in Palestine and Roar where they are here. And thanks to Wu's research. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the most basic thing. And I think it's something that anybody with a relative amount of knowledge or through using this Buddhist roadmap can then contribute to. The genetic side, I'm not a gen anything to do with genetics, so I haven't had a clue how to do that. But in terms of presence and absence, and everyone can contribute to that in some way. So I think that's what the roadmap's building towards. Obviously, there's individuals like Wu who can do the genetics, but I think we're to start with presence and absence is the, the very base that we need to start on. But I also think we all agree with that. I think one, one very important point that we need to remember that where you, places where you have just one species of otter, for example, UK, anyone can uh, give you information about presence absence. You can use citizen science without even, you know, verifying it. But here you are dealing with three species of otters that are rare, elusive, and very uh, difficult to identify. So uh, what I would suggest is that, uh, because let's say you find out a footprint, uh, and if you don't have good footprint, you know that, that there is an otter in this cell, but you don't know which species, okay? So I think if we also think about, MNS can also think about training people about collecting sprain sample in a, in a very simple way that uh, you, Ji Yung, can uh, uh, get you some way, you know, studies help to analyze. In that way, you have verifiable information. You won't have certain cells where you don't even know what what can what species of water is there. So think about these these topics also, these are issues also. Thanks. Yeah, agreed. I guess um, kind of following on with what you're saying is citizens input could be as simple as saying that otters are here, not necessarily saying oh any of well are definitely here. They could say otters are here, and then someone perhaps with a little bit more training or a little bit more knowledge can then go and say right, I'll go have a look and verify. That the hazels are is in fact here, whether that be the camera traps, whether it be through sighting something less likely to something like a hazels are, or whether it be through genetics and something like or something like as well. I was going to say that if we're collecting sprain, or if you're collecting sprain, it will also give you more information on diet because it, it gives you distribution. But once you've created your key, which you're all familiar with, I think that's a priority creating a um, prey species key, but then you can look at it and say, they're eating these, and then you can look and say, but that's declining. You see, that's what's happening in the UK. Otters in fresh water have to eat a lot of eels. But in parts of the UK, the eel population is declined by 95%. Now that's going to have a big impact on otters. So if you're doing a diet analysis as well as a distribution, you can get a lot more information. 
Yeah, agreed. And I think working with people like Sam here, who's working alongside freshwater species, and he can tell you, well, this fish is, is struggling, and then through your diet analysis, however, whatever process you decide to do, you can say, oh, well, I've eating that fish, that's going to fit yours. And things like that, working with people that work alongside the same habitat will also be useful. So may I propose one more thing over here that, uh, you know, eDNA technology has never been explored here, uh, at least for autos. And we have Azam here, he asked that question yesterday. The technique is here, technology is here. You can process all those samples here. And it's much more simpler because you don't need to worry about, uh, in that case, you don't need to worry about any other thing. You just need to filter water. Uh, which is very easy. And then with that water, uh, with that filter, you can find out what kind of species is there in that area. So, so again, don't uh, throw all other methods, but consider this eDNA also as one of the options if you have funding, because uh, that's some that's an expensive method. Okay, I, I guess uh, just uh, Dr. Mabu has set up already straightforward five priorities. So I guess now we have five priorities. Uh, Actually, four distribution, present absence, habitat use, and also diet. The issue and threats, is it already there? Sorry? Issue and threats. Issue and threats is actually another main topic to discuss. Main, another main topic. Yeah. For research. Yeah. I guess. Do you want do you want, do do we want one more priorities to set up a five priority make high priorities research? Let me just as uh the other one are population genetics, behavior, funding, historical data, population trend, policy and law, and local communities. These are the basic ones. Yeah, uh, distribution we already start already. No yeah. worries. Yeah. It's already high priorities. Yeah. So at least uh, yeah, we just want to have more point. A, a lot of people with something very simple, feasible, mm -hmm. something feasible. Mm -hmm. So then at least you know make a point. After you can I make a quick point. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I just was wondering here, I think uh, policy and law and local communities go into conservation and management rather than research. If we are looking at research, pure research, it, sh it should be there, I think. My understanding is in the last several decades, UK auto population you has to focus on recovery. But in this country, still, we may have to focus on the decrease. And my understanding is that one of the major reasons of UK and probably Europe, the water population decline is based on, on river pollution. Is there, are you going to talk about river pollution later? Okay, so, okay, so later. Yeah, sorry, my apologies. May I also, also add a, a little point um, regarding um, presence absence data and reliability of data. Um, as Dr. Sandeep mentioned earlier, it's, it's really important to have um, an access of the, of the quality of the researcher who are collecting the data. Um, I remember a publication of authors in, in, in Texas where um, state, uh, where, where, where national park workers were actually um, monitoring authors and the amount that they're actually um, misidentifying otters for other species, even though there was only a single otter species, was was quite high. So training um, the the ground staff in in identifying the correct species is is, is quite important in in my point of view. And in addition to that, um, I think involving local communities who who probably know their land the best is is an important part in that. So this is just my two pence on that topic. I hope it helps. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Dr. Lila, and also Brad. Improves. Yes, actions, uh, we already improved, improved local communities. 
and also a training for sample collection. So when it comes to sample uh, training for sample collection, uh, spray samples and also footprint samples, so provide training capacity building, which we already include in the actions. For us, in terms of trucks, you know, if, if locals, not just researchers, but also locals could be trained in uh, footprint collection, we get a lot of data in. Um, yes, of course, some of the data uh, Fred can analyze, given, given the time and stuff. But if we get enough data, we can really build the AI, and that could make a big difference. So if the AI can distinguish between species, um, you know, the sooner we get lots of data in, the, the sooner we can build it, and the sooner you can have results. I guess this part of the action as well is to uh, uh, contribute data, uh, database, create database. You know, create database is very important. Uh, I, I, I would wish, I, I would actually inclined to say sharing of data, but then uh, that, that, that is quite subjective and whether we could share. Uh, yeah, create a database, maybe it's one of the actions. So we are still down with all high priorities or do you want to quit at this five or we go on to the next discussion? Next discussion, okay, great. So, okay, actually, I think citizen science will be. So, guess you can put it. So, now we go to the next discussion, which is tracks. So, I guess uh, objective, we could have. Uh, Madam Noan, can you please speak? Madam Noan, so let's put it as a draft word so we can input later. Um, so for the threats objective, uh, um, to identify all the threats in auto, auto conservation, maybe. Maybe somebody want to reword that. Okay, I'm just I'm just rephrasing her, her objective to identify potential threats to orders of collision. Besides identify, do we address as well? Is okay. that is that is that no addressing threats is action. Oh action. Yeah, I think identifying the potential threats. I think everybody can agree that's the way forward. We need to understand why and what's happening to the others and what the threats are and emphasize that. And and just to facilitate this discussion on threats further, there are threats that are immediate threats and there are threats that are long-term threats. So climate change, for example, is long-term. Immediate threat is trade, for example. So, or or something like a highway being uh, built across habitat is immediate threat. Mm -hmm. So, categorize them into two different immediate threats and long term threats, and then we enlist them. So, so should that be? So, should that go to actions to identify immediate and long term threats? That's the actions, or these priorities? So once you once you enlist them in these two different categories, then you can set priorities, right? So climate, change, for example, climate change is obviously not going to be priority because you can't take much action on your own. You need to involve governments and you need to involve uh, interregional cooperation for that. Even uh, otter trafficking, for example, you need to involve other countries. So it goes beyond your realm of. Uh, jurisdiction or um, beyond Malaysia. Yeah, agreed. So in terms of immediate and long-term threats, what, are, what, where do we start in so, climate change? So roadkill, for example, is a threat, right? Yeah, yeah. Roads are threat. Uh, it'll go under immediate, just yeah. to start with. <laughs> I guess uh, human auto conflict as well is an immediate threat. So immediate, we have roadkill. We have uh, human auto conflict. Mm -hmm. 
long term, long term should be have that rep and degradation. I think I would link, uh, I'd like to bring back uh, uh, pollution as a threat. You've got heavy metals, long term PCBs. Um, if, I mean, things like endocrine disruptors found in our plastic bottles work in Cardiff University, the male penis burn is shrinking by uh, 5%. So that's a long term threat, but it's something we should really work on. It's possibly a long term and a short term threat. Um, immediate pollution could be like we, we've worked with the Eurasian officers in the UK with things getting tied around doctors' necks. So that would obviously be an immediate threat. And then, as Dr. Paul kind of alluded to, there's more long term threat with long term uh, exposure to chemicals or pollutants or any kind of thing. Yeah, so we're going to put pollution in both sides for, for the reasons I kind of outlined. Any other? Threats for either side. What about uh, human auto conflict? The illegal trade, I would put pet uh, trade. <laughs> yeah, so, so Sarah just suggested. <laughs> uh, so Sarah just suggested um, availability of prey is obviously a, a major issue for something like yeah, anything else. So we put that in long term. I may change. Sorry. Because of the Intunindari region, a fact of the climate change, we saw the some of the otter get the disease and death yeah, in the Tunindari region. Yeah. Put, put climate change into a long term issue for otters. Yeah, I think we plan to keep it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, I, I think for human auto conflict, there are actually two ideas really uh, aquaculture and also fishing net. Do we bring it down? That will lead to human auto conflict. Or... So, there's a, you think there's a different track? Unsustainable aquaculture farming. That would be long term. It's subjective and there's a very thin line. So some of these things can actually pass. Depending on the time and scale, it could even be um, immediate or sh short term versus long term. Okay. Like we, we were just discussing about change in habitat. Change in habitat here in Southeast Asia is very fast. The scale and uh, timeline is very fast as compared to other parts of the world. So uh, again, don't bog down into putting them into categories. Just enlist them right now. And then you can decide about categories later with further discussion. So I would like to add one more thread here is uh, disease. Somebody said diseases. Yeah. Uh, so diseases related to climate change is one thing, but diseases are uh, zoonotic diseases. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Pata, when he was giving his talk, he showed the, uh, that aquaculture farmers are using these dogs and the dogs are not vaccinated. So transfer of CDV and, can I um, and rabies and other things, it's a threat. Uh, I have two points to actually, um, I don't know which category is this, but maybe you can put maybe under trust or under research uh, prior. Um, there is an um, event of rescuing, uh, rescuing otter during the flood season because there, are, there is an event of um, otter trapped in wires. So we rescue them. So it's like uh, rescue the otter. So I'm not sure whether it's considered threat for the flood, 
So I don't know, because there is, um, yeah, it's an occurrence of um, uh, natural disaster, that is one. And then I uh, have a question on the legal pet threat. Is there a thing such as a legal pet threat? Because under CIDIS, authors are being trained for zoological purposes. So actually there's a permit allowing that because in Australia, um, it's still protected species. But maybe we could um, put for the, I don't know, uh, in the future for non detriment um, findings for author. Yeah, non detriment funding. Because for illegal project, it's illegal, right? It's like under black market, um, et cetera, et cetera. But there is, um, it's more of questions for me. Is there such a thing, a legal pet trap? Because under Malaysia, say this, we, um, not Malaysia, for other countries, they do trade for authors for zoological purposes. So if there is a like, research for that, for non detriment finding for authors, I'm not sure which category is that. It's just like, Pouring our level. Yeah. For site, for site, yeah, the site discount, it allow, you will need, they allow trade, trade with it. So, so uh, uh, okay, what I understand from uh, Conor your, your meaning is the auto trade now, because they are permit, they allow permit to trade for geological purposes. So, is it illegal anymore? So um, I think that's your question, right? And that's a, is it suitable word to put yes, that? No, illegal, I understand there is a legal bit threat. Like mm -hmm. they don't have the permit or like it's under the black market that you do the threat like without people knowing it's, it's, it's illegal. But for legal bit threat, not legal pet threat, sorry. It's a legal threat, <laughs> sorry, not pet. It's for zoological purposes because we do have, um, Ah, because under say this, it's still, yeah, or any other person research purpose or any findings that we do, but for, for any other wildlife per se, not just author, um, what we can do is the, yeah. <laughs> you guys should sit together, you know. So, okay, in Malaysia, uh, especially in Sabah and Sarawak, author goes for pr protected species only. So protected species can be traded. To have it be traded, we need to have the non detrimental findings to know the quota for author that we can harvest from the wild. So NDF should be under research. And then uh, from there, we know how many quota that we can um, harvest from the wild. And then number two is that, is there any need for captive breeding program or captive breeding center for author? So that is also goes under research as well. Uh, yeah. Yes, true. That is how we manage sustainable use for wildlife. So I do think NDF under research lah. And they have under research, but it's not a threat. But illegal threat is a threat. Illegal threat is a threat. <laughs> so I guess one of the action here to address the threat is policy and law, strengthen the policy and law. Uh, why not we up uh, one of the action here? is policy and law, you know, just uh, why not we raise the status of authors from protection, uh, something like so policy and law for actions. Usually if you want to upgrade the protection of author, of course we go for um, parliament or cabinet paper, but provided the research as well. That is why coming back to the research. <laughs> For those around, for those um, ladies and gentlemen in the room who, who maybe who are not still familiar with our regulation because Peninsula and Sabah and Sarawak have different regulations. So in Sarawak, we call it ordinance. In Sabah enactment and in Peninsula, it's under act. So for Sarawak, for example, uh, not for example, the real thing that's going on right now is that um, apart from what Wan has um, mentioned that 
um, it's under protected species, right? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> Shawa, uh, now we, we may uh, in the face of the discussion of WL Ordinance 1998, we're going to revise it uh, for a new, uh, no, not new, like revise the ordinance. So now we, um, I don't think we're going to upgrade the status to protect it, to totally protect it, but somehow we are going to increase the penalty because currently penalty for um, protected um, and uh, protected wildlife in Strawa is uh, one year, yeah, one year, 10,000 ringgit and one year imprisonment, which is like far, far, far cry from act and enactment. So what we're trying to say, uh, what we're trying to do is like increasing the penalty of like to um, 50,000, uh, wait, uh, 50,000, 50,000 and 10 years of imprisonment. For, um, because in the face, we cannot like, it's not final yet, but that's what we're trying to do. Penalty, not apart from upgrading the status of the. Yeah, I guess that comes, but I might be speaking out of town and obviously you will know your laws, etc. better, but I think um, the government is unlikely to upgrade the protective status without the research. Is that correct? They're not uh, gonna... One of the things that's like to, not just, I don't, I'm not sure what, which, which category is that, like policy and law. It is under policy and law, but maybe we can duplicate some part. I guess that is an action to, to I guess that's an action. So we have very put here policy and law. So I think, I think just now, uh, one more I also mentioned about the research part that you do. I think that goes to action as well, in order to identify, uh, even though we just identify, but we're not, Really addressing the threats, but that can go to actions. But I might need you to repeat again what's the research. Uh, uh, well, the action is a very difficult to say because of the pension stand government. In my country, Myanmar case, forest department, they already declare update forest wildlife law in 2018. This for the punish is a very high, but still illegal trade or the wildlife is the growing, increasing every year. For the Asian is the on the ground is the very weak. This is very difficult to slope the, this problem in my country. That's why we found a lot of including the otter or tigers or elephant everywhere wildlife trade is there. Growing, especially for the Shan Boundary and very close to the Thailand, Shan State, very close to the China, the Chin State, and very close to the Thailand, also Tanindari. We cannot control that this three way for the wildlife trade. This is depends on the politic or political or government. My country is very difficult to control, even the law is the very high. Including the Dix otter is the completely protected wine species. This is very high Spanish. But some of the people also go to the J, but just a few. Some, uh, how to say, some area is the correction that is very bad. That's also a big problem for the wildlife trade or my okay. country. Yeah, thanks for the comment. So I guess well, one of the actions that I can think of from, from your issue here is to actually engage uh, with the authorities, engage with the government. I guess that's one of the actions that we could do. Engage, yeah. I, uh, I can do. I think there's one goes to awareness. Or engagement goes to awareness. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm not going about policy and law. I'm just jumping to something else. Uh, that's why, sorry, uh, that's why we need to improve the capacity of the government staff first. How about capacity building? Um, uh, engagement, that one can go to awareness. How about capacity building program? Yeah, yes, yes. Some, yeah. Of, yeah, some of the protected areas that they also really don't know their or that is how important for the our environment or something like that. They are also very weakness knowledge. Yeah, I, I, because I think uh, just recently SFC has a capacity training with traffic, so something like this, I think. Capacity. Yeah. Uh, 
their capacity for the knowledge for research or something basic for the the for XML in the wireless century, they are especially reserved concept to the tiger or elephant. They inside the Tamandi has that stay a lot of small cultured order, but they forget this species. And they talk, oh, tiger is very important. Even they are saying IUCN relics, they forgot. Sometimes they forgot. That's why we need to their sharing knowledge fast, their training to their for forest department, forest staff on the ground, especially for on the ground fee staff. Okay. Um, okay, so my, uh, my, this might be a question in itself as well, because I'm not sure this could be a, I think it's a threat, but I'm not sure if it's, it's already been uh, uh, done or not. My question is this, is that uh, do we have uh, otter rehab center? Because if you find small otters or injured otters, is there a place that we can send this injured? Yeah. Yeah, so wildlife rescue centers, huh? is it enough only in one place or the areas should have it? So should it be considered as a threat in the sense that we do not have enough rehab centers? Okay, I, uh, I guess this would be a question for government agency. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think the three government agency, maybe you all to take turns to answer. I, 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 okay, I know a bit about Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, I, I, did res I did rescue an otter pup before, and they just sent to Wildlife uh, and NWRC National Wildlife Rescue Center. Uh, I guess, but let's pass it to Pelitan, SFC, and SWD to answer this question. Then we will go for a short break. Yeah. Um, for, for now, in Sabah, we have two rescue centers, which is the Lokawi Wildlife Park together with the Sepiluk Orangutan Rehabilitation Center. So mostly um, on emergency cases, most of the um, wildlife goes there. Lah. Yeah. For rehabilitation, of course, um, we do it step by step because now we are not receiving like a lot of um, otter. Um, recently, we received a lot of pangolin, but then um, in the process of um, rehabilitation and also releasing, um, we go step by step and using experience um, by the experts. Okay, uh, for very return, I think Mr. Wood uh, already mentioned just now, we have NWRC, National Wildlife Rescue Center in Sungai, and most of the species that uh, we get from the case or uh, other other sources uh, will will be sent to National Wildlife Rescue Center. Uh, in National Wildlife Rescue Center, we have uh, various uh, a lot of uh, wildlife, including uh, the tigers, primates, the avians, and um, that's a little bit about uh, NWRC. I would say that certain um, basic rehab techniques are universal. I keep the animal warm, hydrated, and things like that, and that'll apply to all wildlife. So <clears throat> when it arrives at the rehab center, if they experience looking after wildlife, they'll be able to do that. But once they've stabilized it, they're gonna need more help. Um, and this is where we can come in if necessary, you can contact us, we'll put us in touch with somebody who specializes in that species. If you get a hairy nose otter, the person to contact is always Nick Marks because he's the only person who's really succeeded to keep the species. And as he said in his presentation, the water quality is essential and he brings it in daily from long, a long pen to the center. So if you get otters, you can contact us and we'll put you in touch with someone. But hairy nose, get in touch with Nick, and he's always helpful. I guess we still have SFC ever uh, respond on the rehab center. I guess one more uh, um, for the main. 
Was? Okay, okay first, go ahead. <laughs> for syrup pastry, uh, we have, we don't have actually, let me just think of the word. Okay, Mata Wala Center in Puching is, um, is a rehabilitation center actually intended for orangutan. But then again, um, there are a lot of cases where we have um, uh, not only rescue and people who who volunteering to um, surrendering um, uh, wildlife, but also confiscated animals from any weight. But um, the thing is, we don't have the space um, just like in other part of the region. Uh, we have limited capacity. We only like have um, we have higher vets um, this year for the center, but the rehab center. Here's, here's the thing about Sarawak. Like, if there is a case of um, animals confiscated in Miwi, we don't have um, rehab in Miwi. It has to be transported to Kuching, which took about um, a day travel. So that's yeah, that's impossible for for auto in case. So if we do, we try to like, uh, we do not encourage um, a rehab if the animals are fit and healthy. We do immediate release. That's for one, um, but if it's injured or if it needs to be taken care of, then we will consider rehab, but um, no cases for authors so far. I'm talking about, uh, but no, no, in the picture, uh, there's the one that I mentioned, the case of a rescue flood. That's a one day um, operation. They trap um, the author and then they release in, in um, what do you call it, habitat as well? Uh, it's a, it's, yeah, in, it's all habitat, but, um, because we don't guarantee that for animals sensitive for life, like just the pangolins, you cannot, truly really cannot do a captive and release. And we don't have, um, we don't have the capacity. We have this manpower and stuff, but it's, it's really hard because there's a lot of things it's to consider. But for rehab, we have a Matama Life Center, um, temporary, temporary, what do you call it? Um, all of the, even the oral hotels are semi walls In the future, if they're, um, um, they're not like, really captive, like if you can eventually survive, they will like release to a release and then monitor. Because I think the important part is the monitoring. We don't have people who can monitor the release, the capture release um, animals. Um, it's most of the rated, but if there's a case of um, rape enforcement happen, then all of the um, animals will be transported or yeah will be like released immediately if it's not exotic species it has to be um yeah is it about trauma a temporary basis yeah and in Sarawak is it we don't have exotic uh, we, we are not allowing for exotic so I'm trying to figure out now for if there is a, in the future cases of any other authors from Lutra and Hernix, what happens? Because in for Pelikan and Sarawak, they are learning for exotic species, uh, but not for Sarawak. That has to be pitted. Okay, I will share the example in Singapore instead. Um, so under Singapore, uh, for also something like this, like rescue and everything, um, probably a little bit touching on what Fendi was saying earlier. Um, if let's say, I'm walking outside and I see suddenly a pigeon hit the glass and just fell. I don't know what to do. What I will do is that I will contact a certain number. Someone will be coming and fetching me. Doesn't matter what animal is that. Even if I'm seeing a pangolin got, you know, hit a little bit by the car, I, I know there's still some uh, not dead yet. I will be calling someone and they will be able to come and look at it. So basically, the animal will not have much, I mean, the threat is reduced. Even, yeah, we know that okay, so anything can happen, but somehow or other, there is still a rescue possibility. There. So that is available in Singapore, it doesn't matter which animal. So, for example, in an author's case, if let's say we are looking at something, whether it's a human getting injured or the author getting injured because of either extreme, but if let's say I'm calling, someone will really come to take care of the author. But now, if let's say I'm walking in the park, or maybe not in the park, because the park will be monitor. Maybe I'm walking somewhere else and I'm seeing an author that is injured, but I know it's alive. Honestly, I don't know how to take care of it. Honestly, I don't know what to do. Right? And at that point of time, who do I call? Or even if I want to fetch it and go, do I know where I'm supposed to go? So all of this is actually a threat to the survivor. 
So, so, so are we able to adjust this threat? So, is it is this really a threat in Malaysia at this point? I I think it is because we really don't know what to do. Even if an elephant, I don't know what to do. You know that kind of thing. So uh, kind maybe of thing. I should comment on that. Um, but before that, I would like to comment on the um, important points that um, our representative from Thailand just mentioned as well. Um, for the judiciary, it is more on awareness. Um, but for the enforcement officer, like in Malaysia, we have custom, we have PDRM also helping in uh, illegal wildlife trade. That is more on capacity building for enforcement, enforcement um, uh, uh, staff. Yeah. So maybe we can um, put that aside, but capacity building um, for the judiciary, it is more on awareness. And again, for your issue, um, this is where we give awareness to our public, where to call to do their shared responsibility on who to call to save the um, particular author or other, other animals. So I don't think it's threat, it is more on awareness. Yeah. So, which means that at this point of time, will this any, uh, information be available, um, like like totally available outside there? You know that kind of thing. So, so I think that needs to be addressed. I, I agree. It's an awareness and education, but until it is become available, then it is not there, right? So then it becomes a threat. Then so how we need to address that threat through education or awareness? Well, I, I guess we'll keep that for the next. <laughs> Topic. Uh, so I guess uh, to, to, to actually uh, action, uh, sorry, yeah. Can I just make a quick point? Yeah. Um, in case anyone does get called about us not, particularly by members of the public, I think you've got to be warning them not to be going in hands on because if they get bitten, it can be serious. Um, to call no. The other thing is if you get a baby otter, you've got to be very careful with the milk you give them because they can't tolerate lactose. So if you give them human milk, or cow's milk, you could end up killing them. So be very careful and contact. Excuse me. I could just add a bit, uh, an otter says with its mother 30 to 14 months. So if you find an otter that's four months old without a mother, can you ignore it? Okay, so to summarize, you have to go to break it in. Uh, it's okay. I think to, uh, for, to, for, for the actions for all this raise up issue, I guess it all goes to capacity building program. It's a training to the government agencies, uh, a training to the to the to the uh, centers, the staff. If they are, have other pumps, how to take care, how do we have, and how to reintroduce? I think I do this. In, I do this possible to actually set up a center just for the authors in Malaysia here. But at the very least, we have the staff. We have the officers in Sabah have already two, Sarawak has one, and also Peninsula Malaysia have one centers to actually uh, taking care of the animals. So we capacity build them, we train them to know how to take care of others. I think that would be good enough. So it goes back to action, which is capacity program, uh, capacity building program uh, for this track. Can I guess okay. one more? Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, uh, one of my experience. Um, in my country, especially one of organization, they change to the livelihood, especially for hunting. One of the kids in Rakhine State, but people is the Chen people, they are hunting focused on just only the elef white elephant. They are not stable settlement in one place. They moving the whole country and they hunting the elephant. One of the my friend organization, they trying to contact the Smithsonian Institution in the US and then they get, they got their projects and they stop doing the all of the not so many people, they are group is just a few people. They are moving all of the family, including baby also. They are never joined the business school or this one. They, has no knowledge. Stop trying to their education or awareness or first day for one year, two years, they get many dog hunting their elephant. And then now this project is very win-win program. Now they are there, stay 
one please test segment they has village they has school and then they are groups never handle elephant that's why we can we are all just species also we can change them who is they especially focus on hunting the hunter we i already kept the some information in kitchen and the new people some of the people just focus hunting the our other species. We are also can change their livelihoods. They are also reduce their reduce hunting for their our otter. That's why my my main target is that we can change livelihoods, especially for otter hunter. Right. Thanks. Uh, I think we will add two points here for lecture. Identify the poachers and. Uh, and look into the livelihood uh, of the poachers. Maybe you could do yeah. something like, you know, uh, convert poachers into uh, a, a, a guardian or communities yeah. really monitor the authors, something like this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I think we are already halfway there. Uh, so let's get a break for 30 minutes. We will be back here at uh, four, uh, 4.45. Um, sorry, I just want to add something while we're still on the point. Um, capacity building program uh, for government agency, yes. Uh, centers, uh, you, you mean like rehab centers. I'm not sure what you mean by centers. But I think another thing is for the community, the local community, that's where you would put capacity building for them to um, understand the author better as well as help with identifying poachers because I think local community they, they, they do a lot on that um, and then I like to add to your roadkill uh, maybe um, roadkill and uh, effective buffer I guess well, what I uh, I guess with roadkill you have to think of a solution so yeah that's that's all thanks
Okay, so uh, I saw in notes as well. Okay, so yeah, welcome back for the virtual participants. Uh, I hope you have a good break time as well. Um, I guess let's get started. Um, for the track part, is there anything else to add before we end with the track part? <laughs> yeah, uh, Mike, Mike, please. For the action uh, for the trade school, uh, it, it, will it be okay if we add in um, gazetteland of protected area? Because Charles is doing that. I mean, Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, it's protection. Oh, okay. It might be because it's a big thing. 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 It's a So maybe on the action as well as what we see in Singapore, there is a need for intervention of the habitat as well. So that would be in the action, especially for fragmented forest. Intervention is uh, one of the tools or actions to prevent uh, to to have it, uh, the solve to solve the issues lah. So intervention of habitat together with um I don't know maybe food food for other um. If we want to provide more inside the habitat, there is a uh, decrease of food inside the habitat, so we need that intervention. Um, for example, for example, um, if this area is not used um, by author, we add in something inside the habitat as intervention to make the author use that um, corridor. <laughs> yeah, it is more on action. Uh, I think to, to add to kind of what Dr. Sandy mentioned about habitat fragmentation, it's not only authors that are affected by this, obviously, 
but they are habitats fragmented that prevents fish from moving to traditional spawning grounds. That that's obviously going to have an adverse effect on otters as well. Otters have the ability to leave the water to cross the habitat that way, whereas uh, fish cannot obviously have that ability. Yeah, Does anyone got anything to add on to that? Yeah, I'll just I'm just going to talk about the illegal trade. We've talked about working with policy and law, working with government officials, but and I don't know how uh, feasible this is, but it's also really important to work in cross boundary, cross, uh, cross nations. Obviously, we know, particularly in relation to Thailand, Thailand's one of the bigger places in relation to illegal trade. Maybe Malaysia isn't, or at least hasn't caught up, as we were discussing last night. Um, but it's really important that no matter how hard Malaysia is working, that also Thailand. Nations that border Malaysia, whether the Indonesia or also Taiwan, are also working together to prevent it. I think I think that's an excellent point about cross-boundary cooperation, and uh, I think you already have this cooperation for uh, illegal trade here in uh, in Southeast Asia. This, uh, we, we have something called Sabin in, uh, in South Asia, South Asian uh, Network for Wildlife Trafficking. I don't remember the full name. Uh, so it, it's already established here in Southeast Asia, but something that has been done in South Asia for tigers specifically is transboundary monitoring efforts. So India is monitoring tigers with Nepal, with Bhutan, with Bangladesh, because the tiger habitat goes across the, uh, the international boundary. You also have something similar. So Dr. Pai, for example, presented her work on uh, otters in Thailand. And that population does not end at the polit political border. Uh, that population extends in Malaysia also. The transboundary cooperation for population monitoring of otters and information exchange is something that is also good. It's not under threat though. So, wait, no, action, action yes. Transboundary cooperation for monitoring and uh, Trafficking, what, what do you want? Health trafficking. Yeah. I think just now, I think uh, Dr. Lila did mention a point about uh, buffer zone for road kill. I think it's, it's for the age of the forest. Uh, I think this is what I think this is what I understand from her meaning that uh, create a buffer zone uh, between the forest and also converted uh, converted landscape. So there must be a buffer zone. I think that is something that maybe we can look into as well. So if we add that into actions. The question actually is whether did we do it correctly or not. So yeah, I'm I'm gonna have the answer for that actually. We already had the statistic whether we did the buffer zone correctly. Uh, I think one thing that can be added is enforcement. Yeah. Enforcement. Uh, I, I think enforcement is very large. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so I, I, have, I have one more suggestion regarding that road kill. Um, I think somebody, one participant, um, one online participant also talked something about that. Uh, many countries are using oh, this. Okay. <laughs> Let, let, let him get in, in a comfortable position. Good. <laughs> okay, so, so the suggestion was that uh, you have, you want to do citizen science and roadkill is one of the major problems here. Many countries have this app that uh, people can uh, download and just record basic information about roadkill. So if you're driving somewhere and you see a roadkill, any species, just record the, the you can record the coordinates, you can take a picture and just up. In that way, you are utilizing citizen science not only for autos, but for many other sections. And it's a very easy way of documenting everything in a very uh, rapid way. So MNS can probably think about developing an app for road kill monitoring in, uh, in Malaysia. Is I think I think you asked this question and I had that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a, great, uh, a really great um, uh, suggestion how to address, not how to address, I mean, what to do if we have bird kills, but not really interventions of bird kills because that's been killed. Uh, what I'm just trying to say is that, yes, it can be under action, like what, what to do with the bird kills. Like citizen science can contribute to the collection of the data, but actually the road close intervention is on the, you know, on the highway or what what to do with the crossings or the what do you call that the convert that, that will be the intervention for the road kill, not the, the solution for the road Thank you. I've been thinking about that for a long time because roadkill is a major problem and it's going to increase because road network is going up everywhere. For example, Sumatra, I have a student working in Sumatra and uh, Sumatra has the uh, highest density of road, road network anywhere in Southeast Asian uh, islands. Now, coming back to the solution, you get one-off information about roadkill, that's not giving you any idea about what's happening. But once you get a uh, uh, large magnitude of data, um, especially represented data from the larger area, you would see emerging hotspots of growth. Or, and then you can classify that data for certain species. So you would know that there are certain areas in the road network itself that has more road kills proportionally more than any other area. Then next step, you think about mitigations. And those mitigations are multiple types of mitigation. You can uh, have barriers, you can have uh, um, what do you call them, underpasses, overpasses. So then you can start thinking. Uh, obviously, for small things like snakes and um, you know amphibians, you can't do much. Um, but I, have, I, I also remember this one island in Pacific where they even have uh, measures, mitigation measures for crabs. So depending on what kind of species you're looking at, you can create mitigation structure. Geographical data is very important for that. You can do special analysis to find out hotspots. You can also integrate data about traffic volume and traffic uh, um, velocity. And then you can do lots of regulatory measures from both ends. You can even put you know, signs that, uh, this, that here's a hotspot for otters to drive slow because otters are known to cross this area. You can even create certain structures that if people it's all about compliance and you know, putting uh, regulations on this. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> it will also help in some mitigation, for example, because these kinds of um, records, right, sometimes it can also show a particular solution. 
particular period of time. And that could be something causing it, probably an encroachment of development that's pushing these animals to a certain site. And then they are rushing onto the roads or some, they want to cross to other habitats. So this kind of possibility. So actually, the matrix is the linear development rather than road kill. Because um, the linear development meaning to say not only just roads, but other things as well, like plantation, like all sorts of things. So maybe we can add on the cuts is the upcoming linear uh, linear development. Uh, not under action. Yeah, Max? Uh, 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 oh, okay. Uh, uh, writing the tabular apps in action, and then uh, here we change to linear development. In terms of those coordinated works, also collecting data on road appeals and analyzing them the data. Before we are talking about, about those, uh, those uh, collaborative monitoring with Thailand, for example, please correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, we have colleagues from Sarah, Sarawak and Tanisha Malaysia. Is, is it possible that actually all those wildlife departments from those three relatively independent units within Malaysia could set up certain collaborative work completely barrier free? Okay, we can't completely exclude the politics, but reduce the importance of politics slightly and sharing the data and analyzing data together, and perhaps you join. So not under anybody's leadership, just three of you, Saba, Sarawa, Peninsula Malaysia, as an equal partner, while that collect data, and just move them freely between them and publish. I mean, I, I don't force you to do that, of course, I don't have any power to force you to do that, but I, I hope it may, maybe it can be done. Thing on that point that is going back to awareness whereby any citizens, any public uh, people, any enforcement agencies sees any road kills, they can report it directly. So it is more on awareness by collecting data. But then we need to think again, like what uh, our participant in the Zoom mentioned, the quality of the data. Who are the contributors? So <laughs> this is another, another thing. Uh, okay? I think I uh, just add, add to Dr. Noble's point. I think uh, you want to emphasize on sharing data among the three government agencies and come up as a one whole big database as a Malaysia instead of, you know, Pritita has their own database, SWD, SFC, and it's not sharing. Then we can't connect actually the data and come up as a whole plan to Everything you can say tonight, but yeah, so because, because as I think, as we know, uh, I think maybe now in between these three agencies, the cooperation is getting better. So I think, uh, it's, I think it's still important to share the data on these three agencies. Uh, yeah. I'm just saying this because I'm in front of the person. But some of my personal experience, for example, I asked for some data, like roadkill data, and the first contact point said, okay, okay, let's do that. Then several days later, the same person came back with sorry, we can't. So from my point of view, public bodies have no reason to 
to encode data and, and not publishing data. Therefore, I'm not saying I should be involved because my main research interest is controlled here. However, if public body could pull data without any animosity and analyzing them data, including road kill or habitat pollution, anything, I think it can be helped rather than doing more damage. I, I, I guess this thing also actually applies to not just Japan. I think we should try not that far among these three agencies we work together. Uh, of course, there's all that depends on each government to see, to see whether this is workable or not. Uh, so I guess the, the best person to answer this question actually is the government to see whether this could be done. Uh, and shall we actually really put it to gear in uh, for sharing of data? Um, I'm just looking up on Sabala, yeah. Um, the data at the moment is not with ours. It is with the researchers that are doing research in Sabah. So, for example, the road kill. At the moment, why I said awareness earlier, because we don't have researchers doing that, so we don't have any data for that. See? So, again, that is why I, I emphasize on awareness for road kills. So, if you if we are talking about sharing data, of course, later we have the one stop center, right? So, they, that is the place where we all gather information about that. So, I do think that is one of the actions that we are already taking research on. Uh, I think I think one of the other things to add on that is that uh, it's not, it should not just be specific to authors, but many other things, including habitats. Um, forest cover, for example, uh, mangrove cover, wetlands, status, you know, all of those things should be coming together as well. Well, I think I'll circle back to the lab and I would really vouch for this. <laughs> yeah. Because, no, because this is, this is a wonderful tool that we, uh, we are kind of underestimating. Uh, Roadkill will also give you information about. Uh, information, I mean, um, some kind of uh, information about the uh, link between habitat fragmentation and road care. Does it happen in those areas where you have more habitat fragmentation or habitat loss? And I'll just give you two more things that came in my mind just now that uh, you can use road care information from the citizen science even for your distribution maps. Uh, yeah, that's kind of underutilized. The third thing is that there is a recent study where uh, in uh, Europe but they have used road kill information to find out the density of that particular as an indirect proxy for density of that species. So yeah, um, try and find out a, a, a sponsor who can help you develop this road kill app. Actually, uh, the apps, we have MNS apps just recently. So when you mentioned this, about this developing this one, I just think of, you know, we could add a function into MNS app Get, the, get all this information from the, all the those MNS members as, uh, across the whole Malaysia. So we could start from there. And that apps is shared by everyone, especially is across Sarawak, Sarawak, and Peninsula Malaysia. So I think that could be a feasible because we already have that. I just need to add the function in. So yeah, yeah. that could be. And if you, yeah. if you need more help in that, uh, the GS function and all, I can help you with that. Because GS function is really important. I, I, I fully agree on um, using apps um, as a source of data collection because um, one of the approaches is that a smartphone is so widely available that you can actively use citizen science, you get um, a wide use and even though the data, data quality might be less good as, as a fully trained researcher is collecting the data just by the sheer amount of data that can potentially be um, collected by, by taking images of road kills or scat of footprints. It can potentially give you a wide distribution among the area. And if you have a big enough data source available, then you can use tools like artificial intelligence when it comes to classification of certain certain objectives that you that you want to use. So I, I fully agree with, with Dr. Sharma on on that of the use of app as potential monitoring source. In Germany the Eurasian uh, the the 
Auto Protection Network also developed an app for, for auto monitoring. So if, if the information is, is widely used, then you have a standardized form of data collection, which is already electronically available and can then be analyzed in, in various ways regarding your research question. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Mila here again. Um, actually, if you want to have a look at how the app works, I have uh, an app where um, we get the real time GPS as well as we ask them to take a photo so that it's a verification of the species of animal. It's called the Marine Mammal app um, and it's, it's free so anyone can download it and look at it and you know if you want to get uh, ideas from it, uh, be my guest. Um, you can download it on uh, Play Store or um, it's also available on Apple, Apple Store. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the so um, I did a quick search about what, uh, what was mentioned about the trafficking app. So rather than invent, reinventing the wheel, that I, I did a quick search and there are research papers doing uh, using iMessages, something that I, I use a lot. So rather than MS having to you know, recreate the new software and everything, you can just use a, a readily accessible uh, software tree like what uh, the Zoom, uh, Zoom colleague just mentioned just now. Um, just want to point that out. It's free, and there are already studies that use this app for roadkill observations. And yeah, just point that out. So I guess we could try to ask for a last call for text discussion before we go to the last one, education and public awareness. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay, let's, let's go over to education and public awareness. <laughs> 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 Yeah, okay, so we'll now we're on to education and public awareness. Obviously, a very big sort of topic, um, but we're open to kind of objectives in relation to that. Um, it could be in relation to children, in relation to communities, in relation to government officials, or any sort of aspect like that. So, if anyone has any suggestions in terms of objectives, then please. Um, the objective for this is to give awareness according to targeted audience effectively. Effectively. Yeah, I say that. I say that's perfect. So maybe anyone can rephrase that. To give awareness according to targeted audience effectively. Yeah, we're going to put down to create awareness to targeted audience effectively. So yeah, so that is, we obviously have to break that down to target audiences. There's, there's obviously children, so that would be one. Sorry? Into audiences. So there's, there's children. There's, I suppose take over here. Local communities and specialties. Children, the star of children. Yeah, yeah, that's where where it priorities is talking about the target audience. All right, right. 
you put priorities, like kalau macam like first or first read that what priorities is it? The implementation kind of thing? Is it target audience? Target you target 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 like who want? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just like a... I don't know whether we want to um, specify each target audience, but um, there is a few objectives that, um, such as dissemination of information for people who love authors, things like that. So that is one of the action now that I can think of now. But if you said that we want to um, break, break down to each target audience, it will be a lot. <laughs> a lot. Like a foundation worker, then. Uh, just wanted to suggest maybe for the you know, awareness, it, sh it should be linked to the research and the tracks that you're prioritizing. Because if not, there'll be a. You'll go everywhere. So your research and the track, once you decide which are the priority, then you can do the awareness. Like actually, I come across you know, like earlier on this morning when we are at the, at the river. So I think the villages around there is our main targeted uh, audience because they affect the authors' movement around. They, because now we are focusing on authors. So I think the villages and the fisherman is the most important one because you can see the pollution, the plastic bag, all this and that. I totally agree. The military and local communities are really important, but also when I openly emphasize to children that if you can also educate children, then that would then lead to further down the line the local communities would also have that education without having to be educated local communities if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, if this audience is very important. But I think when it comes to for this particular purpose of, of setting this up, right? Uh, I think probably instead of going to targeted audience, I mean the objective has to be there, but then instead of going to targeted audience, we go for the, the item that we would want to address. Like for example, if we are saying that uh, water quality is important, then it comes to community what they need to do, then government what they need to do, resorts what they need to do, response and everything. So we, we set that. Main point, and then later at the bottom, then then it's a separate thing that we can target on what what to be addressed or who, how we enter into the different audience situation. That's the main point. Yeah. I I think for most of these education and awareness program, uh, irrespective of your audience, what you want is behavior change, whether it's community, your kids, or any other part. So behavior change is something that we should focus on. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but one main uh, audience that we always miss in these kind of uh, discussion forum is our politicians because they, uh, yeah. Uh, no, we, we, no, we often, we often, we often undermine and we ridicule them that uh, uh, they won't understand and there are lots of things that we can say here. But they are very important target audience and we often don't even count them as our audience. They make policies, they make those decisions that can change uh, the trajectory of these populations of these species for a very long term. Yeah, so so I, I'm not I'm not going to suggest any specific activity, but just I'll just give you a couple of examples that I have seen in other countries. So for example, in India, we have seen that we uh, an NGO has taken some member of parliament to a tiger reserve just for one day, and that has changed their perspective. So India could do so well about tigers because some of these people who are sitting on those high chairs know the plight of that species. 
And here you just need to create that opportunity. You don't necessarily need to train them to build, but you have to, you know, take your information. And, and if you can bring them to a jetty and show them the otters, they would understand. So you, and you don't need to do it for all of them. Just a few key, key person will change the uh, change the trajectory outside. Thanks. Okay, on the topic of um, education, I get the impression we are mainly talking about raising awareness, but I think there's another component to education, and that is training people to help us in the field, training people to collect the correct footprints, training people to uh, you know, find strains and, and collect them for um, genetic uh, analysis. And I think that the next step is to maybe even create some jobs, um, even if they are for you know, part time, but I think. Um, that would make it much more attractive for people to take part um, in health conservation um, if they a gain new skills and b um, earn some money. Um, yeah. I think I totally agree regarding the capacity building of uh, people who will be able to monitor the people for time going for the medical training, and probably that will later fall into. Those people who are making those positions that they start supplying the funds that's needed, but at the same time, also the communities that is the local communities, because a lot of countries we are having the local communities are the, at the main uh, people who are observation and monitoring the local subjects. Very important. Yeah, community environment is yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This one, the community, I think is they have to be the first one also because if we find the habitat of the uh, author is around there, the community will be the first one to cite it. So we have to target the community first, like uh, they were saying that we have to teach the community, like uh, who you have here, she's, she's local here, we know the author. So from his Miles of work, he will spread it to the rest of his villagers. So once the villagers know it's important, they will protect the area. Then slowly from there, they will spread it to their outside friends. So I think community still have to come first. Like for because author is quite new to us, like I give an example on Rotan. Okay. I work with a community based tourism company in Fujin. He, this company has worked with these villagers, which is called Batang Ai. Yeah, it's more than 30 years. And we see the result because the villagers will go for hunting. This is their life. They cannot stop. Go for hunting, uh, deep forest for plantations and so on. So the orang will move away. But we educate the, the villagers that you shouldn't, we cannot tell them totally not. You should reduce all your movement on this so that the wildlife will not be threatened and gone. But, like I said, we give you job. When we bring visitor, you got a job. You got money. So you shouldn't do more on that. Then the wildlife will come. So these words will go up. There will be more visitors to come here and see. So this you will get more money because if you destroy the forest, you get the money right now, but it's gone tomorrow. Your generation won't see it anymore. But you protect the, the environment, your generation, your children, your grand grand grandchildren will still see it. Like we always say, if you destroy the forest, the vigilant habitat, you know, today you see it, tomorrow is no more. So you see it now, you want the people at the back to see it as well. So we leave food free, we don't leave garbage. Yeah. Something like this. I agree. I think alternative livelihoods or at least supporting extra income to communities is, is a really, really important thing because it's all very, very well for us to sit there where we are and say stop poaching, stop cut down trees, stop this, stop that. But if we can provide or certainly help provide or offer ideas to alternative incomes or even better incomes that can use the, the wildlife 
is even better because then they actually, for themselves, they want to protect the family. Because if, if, for example, with you with an agriculture, if, if the agriculture are there, the community can have that support from the community. But we can support something similar with authors or whatever amazing other wildlife we were joined by today, then that's definitely the best way for them. Yeah, maybe what they can um, do is that um, to have a program um, to empower um, to empower local communities on um, giving awareness. Yeah, so that we can create more champion in awareness program. So that is one of the action now. So we train them, we empower them for themselves to give others awareness, to give awareness to others. Um, can I add a point here? You see, when we target um, communities, first of all, we got to know, because uh, as far as I know, because I, I'm uh, dealing with a coastal community of uh, smooth coated otters, and they actually um, go around in the fishing areas, just like the video yesterday. Um, I think there are already pre existing problems between the community and the otters. So when you go in and do this kind of education, you, you have to be aware that especially the aquaculture guys are pretty uh, fed up with the water stealing their fish and all that. And same, I think the fishermen also um, have that problem because here they do uh, drift net fishing. So the fish gets caught in the net and it could be there for hours before the fisherman comes and retrieves the nets. So the otters here, of course, are pretty smart. They will do all the stealing um of um you know fish and stuff and it includes also the dolphins you know so that's why i, I because i've been monitoring this area so i think um we have we uh, it's all well and good because I, I have had failures with community work I, i've been doing community work now for nearly 20 years actually um it's best to do your research on the community before you go down and um start initiating any sort of education um, that's that's my concern. And then also, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a uh, the information you give, it must be uh, related to your road road uh, roadblock, as Fendi said. And also, the information must be uh, targeted. Oh, okay, you want to educate the fishermen, what exactly do you want to educate them in? Because they already know about the otters. So yeah, very targeted information. I, I guess you have to do a lot of um, engagement um, and then gain their trust. And that takes that could take a number of years even before we can actually, um, you know, they trust us and then they start believing in what we say or at least accepting what we say. Yeah. OK, thanks. Would you mind making one comment about financial incentives? Financial incentives have been so popular as well. However, in late early 2000, I don't know why similar paper didn't have been published recently. But financial, I mean, using the nature of the environment to produce self sustaining profit industry is extremely unlike from the current socioeconomic structure. Therefore, even though certain things, let alone the importance, may be local community. Never ever satisfy local need. Therefore, at that time, in early 2000, the author's suggestion is, however, sometimes it works. And that would be something not financial, maybe trust between conservation officers and the local community. Of course, they didn't quantify it because inexplicably in some region. With or without producing the money, somehow conservation efforts seem to be worse. So there are some things more than finance. But if you focus on finance, almost all cases of there are some exceptions, maybe like Masai Mara National Park, but almost all cases wouldn't produce enough money. Yeah, I'd agree with, with both points and going back to kind of combining both points. And um, when it comes to um, as Dr. Robin just said, um, finances might not be the answer. 
and when it comes to awareness and education, things like mitigation, prevention of the conflict might be more important than just handing them some money. So, for example, with the aquaculture, uh, I think it was uh, Reza's Indonesian talk during the week, he, he discussed how um, they found ways basically to stop the autism of fish. And that's possibly, and certainly in some circumstances, a, a better alternative than just giving them money to do. It helps them sustain their livelihood and possibly their traditions as well in the long term rather than just giving them money. So the, the, like, like the previous, the Zoom comment said, you have to gain an understanding of the community. And you, you will have a better understanding of your respective community. So like I get mine and, and everyone else in their respective areas, you will understand better. So obviously you're all from different parts of Malaysia and different parts of the world also. So you have an understanding of that community. And as the Zoom comment said, gaining that understanding and that trust, possibly trust more importantly, uh, is really important moving forward. Actually, I think I need Safa doing um, awareness program. We usually um, consult the targeted audience. We need to say the action for this objective particularly is um, to know your audience uh, through consultation, through surveys, before you conduct any education program to be effective. So basically, when you have consultation with them, when you know their interests, um, in selected targeted group, not just for fishermen, uh, for judiciary, for political um, people. So with that, we can have a uh, effective um, um, awareness program. Besides that, we need to create um, uh, educational tools, educational tools, write up um, to be creative and then um, to be used um, for to have the educational program. So there's two things. To, to action on this. I think um, the overarching thing this is about creating awareness as well as um, creating um, um, alternative livelihood. Um, so under that comes a few action plans here. Uh, like for example, one of the projects that we have done in Papua New Guinea, what happens is that there has been a lot of fishery um, threats that they were facing. And uh, that was not because of the local community, because the local community has been doing this for many years, for many decades. But the thing is, um, big shipping vessels has been coming from outside, and because of uh, some kind of a promise from them saying that they will be able to earn a certain amount of money, so the locals will go and join. But the problem is when the big shipping vessels are fishing a lot, after maybe three years or five years, the shipping vessels, they will move to another place. Now these local communities will be standing with no resources anymore. So for, to solve that problem, what we need is that we did this one, these two uh, items actually, taking the awareness, saying that yes, you are getting that amount of money now, but then are you going to get it in the long run? Because the shipping vessel don't have to depend on that space, but you have to depend on that space and your next generation is going to depend on that. And that is your life for you. So creating that awareness was one part of it. And the second thing was, so to solve that, what can we do? So that is where we created, um, you know, proper uh, methods of uh, fishing just for them, and then get policy intervention to make sure that such big shipping vessels doesn't interfere within a certain water area. And then even for the local communities that they are fishing, they have to take from some areas, not take from some other areas, so those kinds of intervention. Then alternative livelihood so that we get the local community, they themselves, to become the monitors of that space. So they are doing it as a job. Instead of taking someone else to come and do the job, these people are doing the monitoring, these people are going to doing the data uh, collection, and uh, something like a side piece, where they are already doing that particular job. So they are earning. And lastly, they can also become like, if there is a chance of making it a full threat for tourism, a proper ecotourism. I mean, ecotourism is uh, very loosely used in currently, but a proper ecotourism. So all of this. So the, the, the whole thing was to solve that particular problem, but the action plans were all of these things in between. So, yeah. So, that, so that's where I think, even though these are in a few different points, but later when this is being implemented, uh, it will be tying between each other to, to achieve that, that common goal. Yeah.
Yeah, I think what Sarah said kind of hit the nail on the head. You've got to understand the problem, face the problem, find a, find an alternative to the problem, and then perfect phrase of common goal. You we we have a different goal to what they have, but if we can find one that kind of works together, that's how we find the solution. Not just telling them what the solution is. We have to work towards the solution together. Anyone got any further comments on the, the awareness? Can I, can I suggest uh, two more things? Just ideas. Uh, one of them is uh, I was just wondering if you have uh, these orcas, any of these species at local zoos. Sorry? So these orcas that you have in Malaysia, are they there in any zoos in Malaysia? Yes, they are. And yes. so, and are they doing any educational uh, program for conservation of those? Uh, as far as I know, as far as my knowledge in Peninsula Malaysia, so uh, the zoos don't really do any uh, educational programs focusing on altar. It's just a signboard explaining about the altars placed in the zoo. But then we celebrate more of the day, which engage with the zoos to actually do a live telecast of the authors and also explain about the authors uh, behavior uh, captive management uh, all sorts of these things yeah okay so my second suggestion is about uh, selecting a brand ambassador for the species and that has worked very well in certain places i remember um, uh, uh, jackie jackie chan's head was up jackie chan um, for uh, for rhinos and pangolins, right? And uh, we had something similar for uh, tigers and uh, sloth bears in India. Uh, so maybe somebody is uh, passionate about tigers. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So, otters, <laughs> they are certainly better than tigers. <laughs> uh, yeah, but someone who can be uh, your face. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, macam ni mereka boleh je ambil ikan tu dan jual di tempat lain sebab pasal kami memang takkan ambil ikan kemajian ni untuk dijual mereka uh, boleh ambil ikan tu dan jual di tempat lain dengan cara sekali lah sebab untuk dapatkan, dapatkan duit tapi apa yang uh, mereka kata uh, mereka masih nak jaga ekosistem tu kan uh, kemajian ni di kawasan situ dan mereka buat benda tu untuk uh, ikan kemajian ni Uh, habitat dia tak terancam lah Sebab ikan kemajian ni dah sangat-sangat kurang lah So macam itulah kaedah yang kami gunakan Untuk memberi kesedaran kepada nelayan di kawasan kami So, just uh, thank you for that uh, So, what this gentleman has given a very brilliant idea is I think it's a reward scheme So what I think I call it should be a reward scheme Just correct me if I'm wrong uh, Because there are two endangered fish in the ecosystem Okay, the yeah. uh, yeah. endangered fish in the ecosystem. So the fishermen can just sell the fish to other people, but instead they give a reward to this fisherman. If you caught this fish, you release it back. Send us the video, we will give you a reward. So this actually educate the fisherman, you know, using this kind of uh, method. Uh, it, it's not just protecting the fish, but also protecting the ecosystem, you know, not to sell to the other people. So I think the summary is like that. Is there anyone else on the Yeah, I think that's a really good idea that goes back to to kind of what everyone said about yeah. understanding the community. So obviously that's a situation that works with your community. So it's a great, brilliant way to do it. But not to go fast, that's the wrong word. But there's obviously different communities and different needs within every community. And as I kind of go back to it, almost repeating myself. We all understand our communities and when you go to your respective areas, your respective villages or towns or communities, you all understand how you can work towards these goals that we're looking towards that will best suit your community and your area. Hello. So uh, you enhance the brand ambassador and also I think maybe our point is uh, to create more uh, Outreach uh, tools like uh, or outreach platform like TikTok, whatever, I think it's not, not mentioned in the public awareness. So, just like uh, recently, I shared a link to Chiyong case. Uh, there is an uh, uh, animation uh, movie talking about Kapia, and it will be uh, it's, uh, it's backed by uh, famous and Taiwanese uh, actors and men. So, they use Kapia as a subject. And then so maybe we can uh, create a, a animation uh, using a, 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 a subject is memorandum, which is also. And I think uh, in a, a few years ago, they also talk, uh, make an animation of cartoon on uh, Orang Utan as well as Bengali, which is getting a very good uh, response in the internet. So maybe we can explore a lot of different platforms or even uh, engage the university art students create a lot of uh, this kind of topic on author, I think uh, the, the approach will be very wide, not only uh, uh, in multiple languages. I think that's a really good idea and something that is excellent. Social media is such a powerful tool uh, and if used in the right way, it can reach millions and millions of people with what could be described as minimal effort. Instead of having to go and create a workshop within a community, so uh, within 10 minutes of posting a video like you suggested on social media, you can have perhaps millions of people that have watched it or a certain location. It's just such an easy, easy way and in this modern technological world, such a good way to be a waste. Well, these famous students earlier, they are visual storytelling students. Yes, and they can just have to follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> On the right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're actually shifting approach about our project. So I tell them, you know, this is, uh, there will be another uh, Malaysian auto world shop in Taiwan. You know, because I have only do one more shop in each country. So it's coincidentally, they want to do a filming, a filming of our project. So I say, let's come. This is a good opportunity to put your video and spread across a uh, wider audience. So, yeah. I think just adding to that, uh, what the uh, what why has said in uh, you were discussing, maybe involve these graphic designers and uh, mass media students 
uh, by organizing a competition. So in that way, you will have, you know, in it's human nature that when there's a competition, you get more creative. And uh, if you have money, maybe uh, uh, put an award for that. So you'll have lots of entries, and then you can sort of like not be, it doesn't need to be a, a long uh, maybe something that is useful to get out for short short animation. Yeah, and I think to follow on from your your uh, your brand ambassador, that they went perfectly, especially with some of the high social media influence that to get your your video or your animation out. Like, Really, really quite. Uh, 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 Aku kata kalau uh, saya lah sebagai orang kampung apa yang saya rasa Kita untuk uh, menggali bagi orang kampung tahu lebih dalam mengenai pemerintah ni First kali saya rasa kita boleh buat workshop sebagai orang kampung untuk menggali info mengenai pemerintah ni Dan kita suruh mereka sendiri yang buat kajian tentang pemerintah ni So kat situ uh, bila mereka dah tahu tentang pemerintah ni dan mereka buat kajian mengenai pemerintah ni So mereka lebih sebab kesempatan dia tak kenal bahkan tak cerita lah So sebab mereka dah lebih mengenali memerang ni So kemungkinan mereka akan ada rasa cerita kepada memerang ni lah So mereka akan jaga So kalau untuk uh, idea yang untuk reward juga So mungkin kita bagi dia form untuk isi jika dia jumpa memerang kat mana Dia memerang ke buat apa, ke buat apa kan So uh, bila dia dah bagi info tu kepada kita, kita boleh bagi reward tak semestinya dengan duit, kita boleh bagi dia dengan uh, barang-barang dapur ke apa Tak elok juga untuk kita kenalkan dengan orang ni dengan duit So kalau kita bagi dia dengan duit, kita buat benda tu sekadar buka daripada hati tapi sekadar untuk duit saja So saya rasa boleh kita bagi daripada segi barang ke apa jadi ni pun dapat Saya rasa itu lagi baik yang kalau kita dapat info daripada orang kampung sebab mereka sendiri tinggal bersama-sama dengan pemerang Okay, so, uh, so basically, uh, this gentleman's point is uh, the importance of local community involvement. Uh, so what I suggest, you know, uh, do a workshop with the local people and then uh, you know, get these local people to monitor the auto population instead of us. Uh, we also we give the training to them, we give the training to them, and then we get them involved. Uh, if they get a sighting of authors, they can let us know, then we'll give a reward. But the reward is not money. Instead, they give a reward in terms of things that the local people need, like uh, uh, kitchen utensils, uh, some some maybe some food, you know, some something that is a meaning to them. And also, he give a very uh, nice uh, phrase, very beautiful phrase. So, I uh, say, if you don't get to know the things, you won't love it. So, if you don't love it, of course, you won't you, you, you won't protect it. So that's the phrase that he actually mentioned. So, I guess empower community. Community and engagement and capacity building. You just add a capacity building aspect. So, I'm going to Hi, exactly what you said, exactly what we're looking at. What, we're, what we all agree on is getting to know the community as a uh, Yeah, I think exactly what, what he's kind of said does is exactly what we're, what we're all saying and all agreeing on it. It's about getting to know the community. And as we kind of pointed out, it doesn't need to be financial rewards, it could be rewards that they, they need or they, they want or anything along those lines. And going back to the quite kind of repeat what we say, it's getting to know the community. It's possibly that's it. Hi, I just want to add a little bit. I think these are what they call incentive programs, which are um, prevalent a lot in a lot of these Jeff projects. So yeah, you know, like in exchange, um, conservation in exchange for something that the community needs, like um, it could be medical supplies also, it could be, a, it could be just having 
um, a clinic on the island. Um, yeah, incentive programs are basically this is. Um, I would like to share one of the things that I've learned with uh, CITES and uh, USA um, program, um, whereby they have a guideline on how to target participants, target the audience, how to target, what are the key message that needs to um, be presented to them, and then how to disseminate information, and in the end, it's how to evaluate the behavioral change. So there is a guideline on that, but under the CITES uh, USA, it is more on um, the illegal trade for consumption, for, for uh, awareness for the people who consume all the wildlife uh, um, illegal trade uh, products. So uh, as for example, um, in this program, in this um, method or guideline, they know their target audience as for ivory, um, the people who are using ivory is women aged until 25 to 45, which are professional. Why? Because of the status. So the message they want to give is um, ivory is not for status. Ivory is not pretty. And then how their target is where they buy all these luxury items. And then how they, they change, the, uh, how they monitor the behavioral change is that. Um, whereby in the supermarket or in the legal trade um, uh, compound, they survey it again. They do a survey on it again. So it's a long process, but um, I don't know whether we can apply the guidelines within our uh, education and uh, public awareness program, but it, it is a very good guideline actually, uh, just to know how effective our program is and just to evaluate how, um, if there is any behavioral change or not. Because the main thing is that we want their behavior to change. Yeah. So sorry guys, I have to take your time. I know it's six o'clock and everyone's eager to go. <laughs> but I feel like they are missing some one crucial point here is that no matter how much we uh, empower people, no matter how much we try to mitigate, conflicts will occur. And we have to teach people how to accept that conflict will occur and how we manage it. So I think that's a key important part of awareness as well. And me, the Management Ecology of Management uh, of Malaysian Elephants, we work with uh, orang asis and elephants. And the point is not to, to tell the orang asi that you will, the, the problem will, will be resolved. You'll never have to have any conflict with elephants. The, the goal that they're trying to do is how you're going to mitigate this conflict, how to reduce as much as possible. You will have conflict. They're not going to shield food. The, we tell people that you will have conflict. This is how, we, how you handle it. You understand? So we will have conflict with authors. This is how we handle it. I don't have the answers, but I think it's important to address this issue. I'd like to sum up the thing. It's better almost to be proactive than reactive to summarize them. Yeah. Like, like you said, it's going to happen. And if we can find ways to prevent it or start to reduce it, then that is the way forward. Okay. So, I think, I think we'll sum up. Uh, I'll some points. Uh, I think the keyword is co assistance. The promo co assistance uh, is still the positive uh, response and also reception into the into the targeted audience. So I guess that will be pretty good. I think uh, something that the model of uh, what we do, education. Right? So I think um, creating, uh, putting it as much as possible to the mainstream education is quite important. Of course, we don't have such subject anymore. We used to have it last time, Alanda Malaysia, but we don't have it anymore, right? Okay, we just leave it double H, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. But the thing is, um, if we can create materials uh, that is readily usable in schools, so it needs to be uh, readily usable, so, so it doesn't require teachers to go through another full, uh, you know, spend time in, in searching information and everything, so it should be available, and how can we make it more creative in that sense? So, um, I, I mean, this is just a suggestion, is that, uh, for example, uh, United Nations, so they have created a module for youth, so it's known as Yunga, Y-U-N-G-K, Youth, United Nations, and everyone. 
So what they do is that they uh, under the SDG, they have like a, a lot of modules like forest, climate, uh, ocean. So if let's say ocean, for example, that module will have like a um, um, compulsory activity and a, a elective activity. So they, they break it down into five sections. So for example, for ocean, they would they have the first module, which is a uh, just ocean, everything about ocean, just to know about the waves and the, 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 the salinity and everything. Then the second component is ocean and human. Then third is ocean reports and ocean facts and facts actions. So under this, for the first module of the ocean itself, they have like a few uh, compulsory where the student only needs to do one activity. And then out of maybe about 50 electives, he may need to choose one or two, depends on how the organizer is selected. Then once they complete out of five modules, right, probably one and one, so they have 10 total activities. End of the day, they are receiving an ambassador badge. And this badge is coming from the United Nations. So such thing. And we have recently started this in Malaysia under MNS. Right. So, and, and this is this has been started by the Visible and Malaysia, uh, and probably every other MNS branches, every other states can also do that. Um, and, and so, this will encourage the students to do something. Teachers will also feel like, okay, I don't have to do additional homework, but it's already available. Students are able to meet it, and they have an incentive. They are able to complete their, they, they are able to do group activities and learn from each other. And end of the day, they will be mastering something. And in order for them to do these activities, maybe they may need to also involve their parents. So together, the kids will be teaching the parents as well, in a way, together, right? So these kinds of things probably is needed. And I think uh, at the moment, even in the UK, we, we have a lack of um, education materials. And KPA itself has gone under marketing, right? So I think, yeah, so these are the things. It's no one under education, but it has gone under marketing uh, when it was supposed to be an education component. I think we should be back. Okay, I would like to share one of the programs that we have with Sabah Environmental Education Network. So Sabah Environmental Education Network is um, a body which compromise all the environmental education educators and also conservation educators within one network. So one of our program is EE Race. The ERAS is where we uh, gather all the school teachers under our training. And then outcome from this um, training is that they need to create um, RPH, which now this, uh, the teachers call it um, plan for uh, teaching. Rancangan Pembelajaran Harian, plan for teaching. So teachers usually have this program. Teachers usually plan their teaching method. So when they learn about conservation, when, of course, now we are talking about water, maybe we give them, uh, we break them um, in water conservation issues. They need to create RPH on that. They need to create the plan on that. And then um, there is competition for it. So the more innovative, the more creative, of course, if they search more um, uh, uh, information through website, through YouTube, they use it inside their RPH. So uh, when these things happen, the module is already there. Actually, in our schools now, there is a subject for conservation, especially in um, Form 1 to Form 3 science um, subject, together with um, primary 4, 5, 6 science subjects still have. But most of the animals within their textbook is about chimpanzee, about giraffe, giraffe and sort of things. <laughs> only only uh, I mentioned is Harimau Belang, uh, which is the tiger, and also the orangutan. Those are the two animals that I look into my uh, children's textbook. So <laughs> um, what I'm trying to, to say here, if we can have a look um, at the module for creating for order, um, cross-cutting cross -cutting our co-curriculum um, subject. So the teachers can use it inside their um, teaching plan or RPH. So maybe we can ask the teachers to do it and implement it, and we also can monitor it. So we, you can create a competition for that. So you will have a very good RPH for the teachers. 
So they come out with mathematics using RPH, they can use for uh, science, they can use for English, Malay, and so on. So the outcome from it is the module. Okay, uh, uh, my name is Hani and I'm from Pudilitan. Uh, I just I would like to share about our uh, work with Potter. Actually, Pudilitan uh, currently collaborate with Perbandana Putrajaya for uh, surveys and research on the ecology on smooth coated water. Uh, and also, uh, we also do community-based conservation. So uh, now we are in phase one, which is uh, we are getting the data from uh, interviewing the visitors from uh, on, uh, at the lake, lake site of Putrajaya. So, um, we also have done uh, several surveys and monitoring, uh, and uh, also has deployed camera traps at the site where we found the uh, springs and also the footprints. So uh, now uh, we are currently uh, working uh, to uh, analyze the camera traps. So maybe at the end of this year, we can uh, come up with the reports and share with all of you. And the second phase, maybe uh, June onwards, uh, we are planning uh, to involve the communities uh, in the management plan. So uh, this is one of the research for all this property plan. And the project, uh, is led by Mr. Fauzi. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, I think it's great. I think uh, thanks for the information. You know, now we actually, yeah, I think through this kind of workshop, you know, to meeting your this is actually the networking that we know what you are doing, what each each of everyone doing. You know, so this is a very good sharing. I think it's a very good sharing. Yeah. No, we know we can get some focus on our question. So uh, we are at six fifteen. Okay, <laughs> so I guess I guess uh, overall, thank you so much for everyone's inputs. It's a great discussion. We have a shaky start, but and then along the way, the, 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 the boat is getting more stable and stable, and then we got quite a good result. But of course, I think there are more to discuss. You know, it's just a surface one. Um, we, MNS, and more will actually keep everyone updated. We will have a look at it uh, afterwards and then keep everyone updated. Um, so I guess that's all for now. Um, later we will, we will be asking you know feedbacks you know what are the topics that you think that we need to improve as well as for now we have research we have tracks and we have also education public awareness but if you think there are topics that is important to discuss that we can include this could be something that we could discuss in our next meeting to virtually so i guess once again thank you so much everyone for our last activities uh, of course uh, tomorrow we start 8 30 a.m. So uh, tomorrow is more like a, a closing and also the last photography fitting session outside. And so I guess uh, thank you for the workshop achievement as well. So yeah, so for the physical one, for this physical participant, please wear your um, Malaysian Auto Workshop t-shirt for the photo fitting tomorrow. Uh, and lastly, to the workshop participant, thank you so much for staying through until 6 p.m. Uh, really, really glad that you all actually make the effort to join, even though you can't join physically. So, I guess that's all for today. And I think we should mute the if virtual one, if not, they could tell us that we go easy. You mute first, then you say Okay, so the, for, for the physical participants, uh, please get them here at 645. The bus will be ready. Okay, just like this. Thank you so much.